So this is a this is a Catherine who organized event, which means it will start on time and it will run on time. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I just want to first of all just welcome everybody to our first annual, whatever we're calling this, Resident Cataract Day. Um, as you guys know at Moran, we really like acronyms like MOLE or MOLE if you're Jeff Petty and you're trying to make it sound better, Taco Tuesday. The surgical curriculum committee is actually called the LIME committee because it stands for Longitudinal Integrated Microsurgical Curriculum. So what we really need is a great acronym for today. So if you guys want to think about that while you're experiencing it um, and come up with something really cool to call this instead of the cataract day, that would be great. Um, obviously, as you guys know, this is the first year we're putting anything even remotely like this on. And so we just have a couple people that we need to acknowledge. First and foremost, Tony. This really was his brainchild, and I think you guys probably remember the grand rounds that he gave early in the year that was like, hey, I really want to do more for our wet lab. Um, and so he was really able to kind of make this happen. Um, and then secondly, Catherine Hu. Who has been the leader of our Lyme committee and um, is basically responsible for everything in this room and that is happening today and has sent um, probably 275 emails in the last week alone just to make sure that everything is well organized. So she has stayed up late many, many nights to make sure that we can all be here. And then... Uh, Mostly the wall clock I'm responsible for. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone quite attention for this wall clock. Very proud. Fun. And then, of course, none of this would be here without our industry sponsors, and they have just been absolutely phenomenal in all coming together and being willing to come here on the same day and share space and let us try all of this technology um, in, a, in a wonderful collaborative learning environment. And the second that we asked, you know, like, hey, can we get a Malugan? Hey, can we get MST forceps? Hey, can we have you guys come? and bring your FACO machines and oh, by the way, we need microscopes and hey, what about viscoelastic? Um, it was every single company up here was more than generous. And so we are really, really appreciative to Alcon, Zeiss, Corza, j and BVI, MST, uh, FCI. You guys have all been just thank you, thank you, thank you so much for what you've done for the residency. And um, last but not least, when you see Tyler Etheridge, make sure to thank him because he is covering consults today. So he is... And Tony and Tim. Oh, and Tony and Tim, too. Oh, that's actually, I have one more person to thank. Uh, Tyler Etheridge, make sure you give him a big hug and say thank you, because he's very much taking one for the team. And then finally, Tim Trong, who is our graduating glaucoma fellow this year and has been an integral part of the Lyme committee and really just more than willing to step up and do whatever has been asked of him, including covering consults. Um, so Tim is also leaving us in a couple weeks, which makes me very sad. Um, but we couldn't have done this without Tim as well. And then the rest of the Lyme committee, Aisha and Mubarak have also been just really, really wonderful. It's been a lot of like late nights outside of clinic, uh, a whole lot of emails. And so anyone else who wants to join the Lyme Committee, we are recruiting for new members. So let Catherine know if you want to join. Cats, cataract application of technology and surgery. Ooh. How about that? Cats. Cats. I love it. Sorry, I'm thinking about that. Didn't pay any attention. Didn't. No, that was perfect. I didn't say, I literally, that was the most important thing I said. So you really like locked onto the key things. And with that, uh, I think that we will go ahead and get started. We're lucky enough to be joined by one of our distinguished alumni, Mike Murray, and then Catherine Hu, who are going to just start us off talking about lenses, which is not something we get a lot of really thoughtful lectures on right now. So something we wanted to change. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started. I'm also going to say, if you haven't grabbed breakfast now, we're just going to go through some housekeeping items so please go grab breakfast also during while i'm talking please go p feel free i know it's an awkward spot but you should definitely grab food and stuff just some real quick house yeah this is a thank you to everyone and then um 
just really quick, everybody should have a printout of the schedule. Um, just kind of know where you're going to be. There's different locations for certain labs. Um, and then residents, I did send you this through email. Not everybody has the names, but um, just make sure that you know where you're supposed to be. There's certain assignments. Obviously, you guys can switch up if you want to, but just so that we have a space dedicated to, to all of you guys. And we'll throw this up also during the rotations. Um, and then housekeeping issues, there is a biohazard waste bin. It's very sophisticated with a Sharpie marker uh, over there in the back corner. Um, but please dispose of biohazards in this designated bin um, because, you know, any pig eyes, we just have to take it out to the, uh, the dumpster afterwards. Um, and then if you have extra time, so I know we have some med students with us, and then we also have, you know, interns and uh, fellows as well. If there's not a time that you're, you know, assigned to a station, please feel free. There's a ton of still, like, you know, unassigned industry, um, stations for um, new devices. Um, also, um, MST has their micro in instrumentation set in the outreach conference room. So feel free to practice implanting and explanting um, IOLs there. I mean, we'll just have some extra stations set up for everybody. But also feel free to just float around to anyone else uh, if you're not, or any other station if you're not assigned. And then residents, please, please, please complete our pre and post surveys. We'll also have an attending um, survey as well, just because we want to be, keep doing this. And we also want to be able to um, continue to this for additional years. Um, and yeah, I think I'll get started with our lecture. Did everybody get breakfast? You're, like I said, when I'm talking, you can feel free to Go get it. So, um, all right. So, <laughs> this is going to be a basic overview for the residents. On you know, today is dedicated to putting it all together. For those who don't know, for the last three weeks we've had lectures, uh, three sessions actually. You know, on the basics of cataract surgery, anything from wound construction all the way to you know instrumentation, FACO, and preparing for complications. Um, some of the topics that we hadn't had yet is just kind of a basic overview of lenses. We hope to do more of that. All as well in the fall. But this is just to help everybody put it together, also putting it to practice. I also wanted to keep this pretty basic to how ILL choices specifically affect surgery decisions. So as you know, there's this big chart in BCSC that I didn't really understand when I was a resident. But when I tell a patient, when I'm discussing biometry, I tell them, you know, we're going to bring you back for one more visit for a technician who specialized to measure your eye. We're going to measure the curvature of your eye and the dimensions of your eye. And then there's this great guy called Todd Proctor, and he puts it into these all these calculations and formulas, and it magically spits out the best lens that we are going to choose for you. Um, but in reality, you know, we have uh, formulas that use different variables, including you know the A constants of the lens based on material curvature, um, keratometry values, which is like the steepening or curvature of the eye, um, axial length, white to white lens, like this, as you know, on you know biometry measurements. And in modern times, we actually have even more accurate ways and very so sophisticated ways of doing these calculations for lens implants. Um, for example, now the Wayne Koch adjustment. Oh, let me see here on the left side of the screen. Um, the Wayne Koch adjustment is a kind of a plug-in um, formula or a plug-in modification. It's an axial length modification that can help hone in results for long myopic eyes. And then, for example, formulas like um, Holiday 2 and Hagus incorporate a measured ACD or anterior chamber depth. And that can give us more accurate results in short hyperopic eyes. So most attendings here use the Barrett Universal to help choose their lens. Um, but they do have some tiebreaker formulas for certain situations. This is just an example of some formulas that some will use based off of, again, just the certain variables that they incorporate, which may make them better predictors of long eyes and short eyes or even post-refractive eyes. And then this bottom one here, so I don't see a, this bottom one here is Hill RBF. Ooh. Okay, but this bottom one is Hill RBF, and that one actually uses um, artificial intelligence, so it doesn't have prompters for certain trends. Um, and so that's also a new one, and there are also other ones with artificial intelligence that help predict, again, the best kind of IOL implant for that eye. <clears throat> and then, so when we talk about sphericity, we're talking about the lens shape and refractive properties. This is different than spherical, uh, sorry, spherical aberrations, which we won't get into in this very basic talk, but um, something that I was also confused as, 
confused with as a resident. So spheric lenses are kind of the traditional um, conventional lenses, you, you know, in contact lenses and optics. Spherical lenses are shaped like a part of a sphere, as the name suggests, and they resemble kind of the surface of a baseball or a beach ball. And the contact lenses or lenses that are spherical have the same curvature throughout the entire refracting portion of the lens. Here. Um, and then aspheric lenses have a more complex shape. This, uh, the curve actually gradually changes from the center of the lens to the edge, and the edge is flatter than in spheric lenses. So spherical lenses, the peripheral parts of the lens actually have different, uh, different focusing power, and it can be defocused compared to central light rays, whereas as you can see on this uh, diagram, aspheric len lenses, a little bit more um, sophisticated. Peripheral lenses, the peripheral lens, excuse me, is adjusted to maintain focal points consistent across the entire width of the lens. Um, so in contact lenses and optics, like I said, um, peripheral distortions can be caused with spheric lenses. Um, and they can bend light, and all the light doesn't um, hit the retina. And then you can see here, which this is also these are courtesy of Tim Trong, so thank you for these slides. Um, but you can see here, this is kind of how it visually manifests. The different curvatures on the surface and the flat edges on an aspheric lens on the left side um, show how it focuses light more precisely than a spheric lens. This also creates a wider field of view, whereas the periphery and the center of a spheric lens um, can be more distorted um, or different from each other. So most of our lenses here on consignment, our IOLs, our single, our single piece IOLs, are aspheric lenses. Um, and that can include some of the lenses that you might see here today um, at our IOL folding st stations. We're hoping that you'll be able to practice folding and loading um, three piece and also single piece IOLs today with our sponsors. So this is including the BNL and Vista, the Alcon SN60WF, and then also the J&J &J Technic CC Boo. We also have on consignment, you know, our DI Boo, um, and then of course Clarion now as well for Alcon. Um, and then in terms of our three-piece IOLs, which you will also hopefully see today, we have the Zeiss CT Lucia, Alcon MA60AC, and then the Technus ZA9003, uh, so as the AR40E. Um, and these all have different properties, but like I said, beyond the scope of today's talk, but hopefully you'll get, um, you'll get experience folding them and examining them closer today. Um, and then speaking of three-piece IOLs, um, I remember when I first started at the VA, Dr. Simpson encouraged me to always have a backup lens. <laughs> so just in case, you know, things go south and you may need that during your surgery. So um, what uh, you might have seen this Dr. Hill, this uh, Dr. Hill IOL power calculations, and it has that big chart where if you have a certain power, um, you would convert it for bag to sulcus lenses. If you're placing a three-piece lens in the ciliary sulcus rather than the posterior um, capsule. Um, but kind of breaking it down, this is also uh, courtesy of Cataract Coach. Um, but there's a simple rule of nines for converting sulcus power, um, sulcus power and bag power. So as the IOL moves more anterior in the eye, the patient will experience a myopic shift. So a patient will likely have, uh, meaning that a lower IOL power is needed for the same refractive outcome, again, if you're going from bag to sulcus. And so this means that the sulcus IOL will need to have a power lower than the same IOL place in the capsular bag. So these are rule of nines, just saying that they can be kind of grouped generally into groups, splitting at IOL powers 9, 18, and then 27 and then the power respectively is reduced by 0.5, 1, and 1.5. If you do have optic capture, which again we teach a lot here, um, optic capture is when you actually put the haptics in the ciliary sulcus, but then you tuck the optic into the posterior capsule. You don't have to do any um, adjustment for the power because it's assumed that that will be basically posterior capsule power. All right, and then almost done here. So just a couple more kind of special considerations. Um, it's always good to ask, you know, if patients have had PRK or LASIK, not only because it affects your calcs, but also because um, there is a LASIK flap there if they've had LASIK. Some, uh, some attendings will not use the optical zone marker on uh, patients with LASIK. I remember when I was at the VA as a graduating chief and I mashed that, uh, that OZ marker onto a patient with LASIK and Dr. Nakasuka was like, oh God. Like, <laughs> so you can, you know, disrupt the flap, especially when you're making 
your, your incisions, just be uh, just be mindful of that. In terms of RK, um, as you know, it's important to you know note the amount of RK cuts, especially with our residents who are at the VA and you know a junior resident may be seeing the patient and a different chief may be operating. Just because you know if there's a lot of cuts, you may need to make a scleral tunnel. Um, then with patients that have had you know post vitrectomize or silicone oil, these change the refractive indices of the biometry measurements. So just always making a note of that as well in your you know notes and surgery card. And then also for post vitrectomized eyes, there's kind of two different issues. Like I said, number one, the vitreous has a different index of refraction than um, somebody who's been post vitrectomized or avitretic. And then is the lens going to sit more posterior in the eye, either due to you know lack of an anterior hyaloid face or zonular weakness? The IOL well, optic may sit a little bit more posterior after cataract surgery. So in these cases, um, just aiming a little bit more myopic or powering the lens up by 0.5 can help buffer against a post-hyperopic shift. Um, and then also just some, some attendings avoid hydro dissection in patients that have had, you know, even, you know, anterior, uh, even anti-VEGF injections or, um, or um, a PPV, just assuming that there may be a break in the posterior capsule or an occult kind of break there. So they... Um, they will specifically do hydro delineation. I know Dr. Lynn does this, and now I do this after a few poor experiences. Um, so there's something to kind of consider in terms of what you're thinking today about how these properties change uh, your surgery. All right, and then with that, I'll hand it over to Mike Murray. Okay. Can I give you enough time? Oh yeah, sure. Any comments? Yeah, go ahead. Terrific presentation. I love the graphics <laughs> of the explanation of uh, sphere collaboration, asterisity. Uh, the um, some of the lenses, like the Technos, for example, and the Alcon now. Uh, actually have a negative sphere collaboration. So unlike the positive that you showed there, uh, they have sphere collaboration, but in the opposite direction right. to counteract the po uh, corneas positive sphere collaboration, ideally so it'll end up like a true spheric lens. Uh, the BNL doesn't, that they chose that on purpose. And depending on, on the patient, uh, I found it helpful uh, looking at the sphere collaboration at a six millimeter aperture preoperatively as part of biometry to try to match which lens you might want to use. So you know, a previous hyperoptimization will typically have a, a lower uh, sphere collaboration, yes. less in the normal 0.25, and you may want to use an a or even an old positive sphere collaboration for that. Uh, the status plus myopic uh, ablations often the, with a higher uh, higher sphere collaboration than normal for the negatives uh, tend to work well there. Uh, all of those, if they're positive or negative, being more sensitive to decentration. The true a sphere, like you pointed out, less sensitive to decentration. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, definitely, like, beyond the scope of today, but definitely things that I uh, actually wanted to speak with our senior residents as they go into um, their PGY4 year. Which, which is, yeah, very valuable, so thank you so much. And what he's talking about, if you didn't understand it, when you're on rotation with Dr. Chaya, yeah. he will go through it many times with you and look at the Q scores and everything. So, hi, I'm Mike Murray. Um, I did residency here. I know a lot of familiar faces. It's really fun to be back. One thing I wanted to say is my lecture is not gonna be as like basic science-y, kind of OCAPs related. And I wanted you guys to think about that in the context of this video that kind of introduced my lecture. Um, and uh, just kind of substitute in for OCAPs. Also, for all the residents, I put this video on double time speed because I know you went through medical school and just watched everything on double time speed, and maybe you still do that. So um, don't want to lose your attention here. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so we don't have sound is the muted. problem. I think I'm muted. Let's see here. OK, let's try it now. Hey man, how's it going? Pretty tired. I'm in the middle of my step one dedicated study time. What's that? Oh, we got eight weeks off to study for the step one medical licensing exam. Eight weeks to study for one test? Well, it's important. You have to pass it if you want to be a doctor. So you're tested on things like anatomy and physiology? Yeah. And diseases and treatment? Oh yeah. And the U.S. healthcare system? Uh, no. You don't learn about the U.S. healthcare system in doctor school? No, we're focused on other things. Because it kind of seems like the first thing they should teach you. Like, welcome to healthcare. Here's how it works. Well, it's nothing about like how to deal with prior authorizations. No. Or like how patients get their medications. No. How about medical billing? Do you know how doctors get paid in the U.S.? Yeah, you, you do medicine, and then they give you money. <laughs> Who is they? The money people. <laughs> Listen, there's so much material, we don't have time to learn everything. So what do you have to learn for step one? Things like lysosomal storage diseases. It took me forever to memorize the enzyme deficiency that causes Fabry disease. Alpha-galactosidase A. 
Well, we also have to know about all these rare disorders like maple syrup urine disease, accumulation of branch chain amino acids in the plasma and the respective branch chain keto acids in the urine. Interesting. Yeah, but we have to memorize it. Why? Be because I need to pass the test so, so I can be a doctor. But you have a phone, right? Yeah, so all the information in the world is inside of it. It just seems like you could spend less time memorizing things and more time understanding how your job for the next 40 years is going to work. But it's not on the test. <laughs> Okay, so a lot of these things are not on the test, right? Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about like how to think about premium lenses. And a lot of this is how you're going to talk to patients. Um, but just keep that in mind as a resident. It's so easy to get focused on like OCAPs, OCAPs, OCAPs. Is this going to be on the test? There are so many things, medical billing, like they're saying how patients actually get their lenses, how you get paid, that type of thing that's really important for life. So. Um, we're going to kind of do a big approach. You know, your surgery and post-surgery is kind of like a tip of the iceberg. And if you prepare for things with your foundation, how you talk to patients, then you're going to be not as surprised by all this stuff that's under the surface, OK? Um, this slide is a dedication to Jeff Petty. He does memes in all of his presentations, if you've seen them. Um, so I have a lot of like pictures throughout. This is to remind me that you guys are going to have to partner up, and we're going to do a little bit of like talking to your neighbor. So. Um, Hopefully everyone has a partner. Make sure you have someone next to you you can talk to, okay? When you're talking about patient selection for like multifocal IOLs, there are objective things that you're gonna measure and that you're gonna look at, and then there's subjective things, things you're gonna ask the patient about, okay? So when we look at this, this is a case, 68-year-old uh, male, he presents after cataract evaluation for his pre-op exam with IOL calcs, okay? So this is gonna be a 30-second activity. You're gonna turn to your neighbor, you're gonna say, what objective information do you wanna know, things you're gonna look at before you even go into the room, and then what are you gonna to wanna to get information in the room? Because those things you're gonna build when then you do your discussion recommendation. When the patient says, I don't know, doctor, what do you recommend? You better have something that you recommend. Okay, ready? Go. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to bring you guys back in, do about 10 more seconds, and then kind of wrap it up. <clears throat> All right, I'm bringing you guys back. So these were some of the things objectively that I thought, okay, this is some things that are important. Uncorrected, corrective visual acuity, manifest refraction, you want to know what their bad is, interocular pressure. So just to pick on Sam Wilkinson, because we went to high school together, so fun, right? Um, why do you think that some of those things like, you know, anterior basement memory disease, dry eye, keratoconus, glaucoma, AMD, why do those matter when you're looking at a lens? Um, it's going to affect their um, multiple calculations and their visual outcomes. If someone has raging AMD, you don't want to promise them a 2020 glasses-less uh, future. Totally, totally. So I think you got to know those things. You got to frame that discussion. Um, and then looking at ILO Master, we'll talk a little bit about. Um, I usually kind of lean on the ILO Master and check some things with the Pentacam OCT Mac. So I get an OCT Mac on all my cataract patients. Dr. Chaya does that. Um, you don't have to do that, but I've had patients that look. This is representative that you can get an OCT that looks like this. So um, is it George? Yeah. Hey. Um, how are you doing? Uh, why would you say this would affect what you talk to a patient about, or how would it affect what you tell them? Uh, when it's like the outcome, you know, say the patient might have the cataract surgery. Totally, because they might think, oh, I have this distortion centrally, I have this little you know, spot from my macular hole, and that's going to get fixed with the cataract surgery, right, doc? And then if it doesn't afterwards, or say you put a multifocal ILO on this because they didn't know or you didn't know about it, that's going to be a different discussion, right? Um, let's also talk just a little bit about um, when you get like your IL master calcs, 
Who's next? Aisha. We did like a little bit of uh, research when she was a med student, and now she's like grown up and a big resident. That's crazy. So helpful radiologist sign up there, the green circle, right? So what are you seeing up here? Just briefly, just that circle. Oh, just that circle? Yeah. Uh, like the difference of astigmatism is like a big thing and where their astigmatic axis is. Right. Would you say that's like kind of a high amount of cell or like uh, kind of low? It's good amount. That's pretty high, right? So if it's pretty high and you have a pentacam that looks like this, how are you feeling about it? That's pretty good, right? That's pretty regular. Um, it was a six degree axis. This is pretty close, right? So you're feeling pretty good. Um, how would that change if their pentacam looked like that? It's very irregular astigmatism. Right. I mean, if you look at that, you're like, what are we going around the wheel of fortune here? 40, 49, 46, 47. Like, what's going on, right? So um, that's what I'm talking about, where you kind of like look at the IOL master, you get a kind of a feel for things, but the IOL master does not give you any kind of qualitative data. It's just like spitting out a number of like, oh, we average these things and here you go, Aisha, go ahead, go do a toric, go do a, you know, multifocal. And for you, like, you've got to think about that and kind of check things with that. So that's what I think <clears throat> is helpful. This talk could be like an hour long. We're going to keep moving. Um, so then uh, just a couple of pearls because they wanted me to give pearls about astigmatism and private practice and stuff. So um, as you get older, you're going to drift, right, from width the rule, which is steeper, like in the, you know, superior axis, and then you're going to go down into like 180 where it gets a little bit, you know, steeper against the rule. So that's ATR. So you usually correct that a little bit more aggressively. If you bump someone up to width the rule, they'll probably drift throughout their age. So you're not going to, you know, be as worried about that. Um, you have surgically induced astigmatism. So when you make an incision, usually about 0.2, so you got to, you know, put that in. These calculations, so Alcon Toric has one, JJ Toric. I'm sorry for the BNL folks. I don't know if there's a BNL specialized Toric calculation. Okay, all right. So, um, but those are really clutch. If you get on their websites, that will incorporate in, okay? Um, if you're going to deal with astigmatism and it doesn't calc for a toric, lricalculator.com is awesome. Um, I use the Dono, Donafeld, but there's also the Nikomen. I think Chai likes the Nikomen. Um, and then you can cheat. Like, say you don't want to do an LRI, you can do extra paracentesis. That's something I learned in Colorado if you really want to cheat with it. Um, verify these things with Pentacam and just know, so I'm not a huge... I'm just second laser guy. Sorry for all the other industry folks here too. This is uh, just my opinion. But LRIs with Femto are clutch, okay? So that's one thing where you'll see when you do it by hand, you're like, oh, I'm going to do it so smooth in one motion with Dr. Chai. And it's going to be like, and you're like, oh, gosh, I look like I'm in first grade learning how to color. Like, it's hard. Um, and the Femto ones are beautiful, right? Um, okay, yes. Yes. Can you actually explain what paracentesis cheats are? Like what you oh, so say you're sitting there and you're like, um, this person has a 0.4 um, area of astigmatism that I want to correct, but they also have really dry eye and I'd rather not cut their limbus at like, you know, 90%. Um, or they have a lot of panis or something like that. So you can just make some paracentesis on the steep axis and it will flatten things out. So that's what you can do. And... What is it? Chai also says, pairs are free, right? They seal up nicely. They're not too bad. Oh, the other thing on the bottom, the older person, the older the person, the more the effect will last for LRIs and stuff like that. If you do it on like a 50-year-old, their cornea is pretty robust and it might not last. If they're like 80, it's going to last. So don't be as aggressive with maybe them. If they're like younger, like 50s or whatever, you can be more aggressive with your uh, astigmatic correction with LRIs. That's something I learned from Mifflin. There's so many pearls, guys. Everyone here that you'll work with is super great. Okay, subjective stuff. Hopefully you talked about hobbies. Um, if they read a lot and do a lot of sports, you know, that's something you're going to put into consideration. If they work in Park City and drive Parleys at night all the time, something you want to know. Um, kind of past contacts, glasses, experience. This is where I ask about monovision. Have they ever tried it before? Um, and then get a feel for their personality. So not that type A people and engineers and stuff can't do well with multifocal ILLs, but you might need to spend more chair time with them. One of the reasons I think we get paid more for multifocal ILLs is the chair time required. So that's kind of what you got to think about um, with that. Um, okay, let's keep moving here because I know we got to get to the FACO Dynamics. Great book by the way. Um, so a little bit about financials and ethics and practice, because I think this is important. In the cataract industry, we get paid more when we put a multifocal aisle in. 
I've heard a resident say, oh, I wish insurance would pay for it. That would sort of kill the multifocal ILL market because if you know anything about insurances and Medicare and reimbursement, they've been cutting things over and over to cover costs. So a cataract on average from Medicare will pay you like 500 bucks. It used to be like 3,000. Sorry, we didn't practice in the 90s. Maybe more. I don't know. 10,000. Um, so anyway, uh, if insurance did cover multifocal IOLs, that would probably be slashed. So um, this is something, though, that you have to have in your mindset of not like making everyone do a multifocal well and feeling like really salesy about it because you will get this icky feeling inside. The other thing uh, is that not everyone is a good candidate for it, right? So you can't just put in everyone and say, oh, cha-ching, this is great, right? So you have that bias in your head going in. Know that, and then when you go in, if you believe in the product, if you actually think they're a good candidate, then that's how I feel good about recommending it to patients, and that's how you'll have like good outcomes and, and happy patients with you. Um, because with reimbursement, you'll get paid by an insurance, and then that person has to give you, you know, the money for the multifocal IOL. Um, in general, just don't use any technology you don't believe in. Okay, so try out technologies. Uh, I say this with like MIGs and you know any rep that comes in saying, oh, this drop is the greatest thing in the world or whatever. Make sure you believe in it, and then if you like it, then use it. Okay, um, and that's how I feel about multifocal wireless. So here's a case. That guy that came in, he has a brother, 78-year-old male. Um, he has hobbies of watching TV, he doesn't drive at night. I will master Pentacam OCT kind of check out. Um, so you have 30 seconds to tell your partner. You have lens options. You're just gonna tell him real basically, what are his lens options? Ready, go. And make it short, because he has a short attention fan. <laughs> I just have a lot, so I gotta like. Okay, about ten seconds left. Okay, let's bring you back in. So for this guy, um, I don't know what you guys said, um, but I'll tell you what I usually say. So this is my 30 seconds build. Does anyone have a stopwatch? I don't know, you can time me. I say, okay, so your lens options. There's ones that do far and close. You can do just far away and then wear glasses for up close. Or you can use just up close and wear glasses for like TV driving and other things far away. Um, and the people who really like the ones that are far and close, uh, like the freedom of maybe not having glasses. If you're used to wearing glasses, you may want one of the other ones if you're planning on that afterwards. What was my time? <laughs> 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Not super long, right? You can't go too complex with patients or they'll just be super confused. So you go pretty short. Um, there are other things that I talk about every time, right? So let's just do a little bit of example. So you can lead with the positive. I feel like with multifocal IOLs, the thing that I got drilled in my head in residency is like, glare, halos, glare, halos. Make sure you tell them about glare, halos, which is good, and you will. But like, for example, if you're telling someone about the Moran Eye Center, right? They'd be like, hey, how's the Moran? How's it going? You wouldn't probably be like, oh man, I got a parking ticket last week downstairs because I parked in the parking garage. And when you get a page at Primary Children's up for the HICU at Huntsman, I just like want to throw the call bag down the stairs. And oh, have you heard about inversion? It's this thing in Utah that like makes it so you can't see the mountains in the winter and like my asthma is killing me or whatever, right? You're not going to lead with that. Are you, right? You're gonna be like, oh, number one ranking in the West, Moran is awesome, and like all the good things about Moran, which I've been telling you guys, like you have awesome surgical training, your numbers, but also the quality of numbers will be great, all that stuff, you guys know. So the same thing with a multifocal IOL. I tell patients about how it does far and close. I tell them about how they have flexibility. Some of the quotes that I've heard some of my mentors use, these are some of our happiest patients, that's true. 
Uh, it's a great investment, investment in your vision if you're a good candidate, right? And then when you talk about side effects, glare halos, you have to talk about it, okay? So like this, <laughs> don't be that guy, okay? Don't be that guy. When I talk about glare halos, often what I say to people is, when you're driving at night, you're going to see an expansion of the headlights. This usually gets better over time, but you will have it and probably won't always uh, go all the way away, okay? And then you need to talk to them about that and see what they say. People who fixate really uh, a lot on that, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the EDOF lenses versus multifocal IOL. So things that you should understand is like this top stuff, right? So monofocal IOL, the light focused on a single spot, okay? The bifocal, that's like the panoptic synergy lenses that you have. They have two distinct, distinct spots, right, from those ranges. Now, the EDOFs were designed to have an elongated focus. It's actually like a patented term, right? And so that's what you're gonna understand up there, right? But what I tell patients, I'm like, there's a multifocal, there's a multifocal light, okay? The multifocal does a full range and has more glare and halos. The multifocal light has less of a range. It'll give you like, you know, intermediate. You get functional near, we talk about, where you can see who's calling you on your phone, but you probably have to use readers for reading up close, but you have less glare and halos. That's what a patient needs to understand. If you get into this stuff with a patient, also, it's just not gonna go super well, and you probably don't need to, right? Questions about this stuff? Okay, um, we'll keep moving on here. So you just had this big discussion with the patient. You kind of laid <clears throat> your foundation. Now you're going to the surgery itself, right? So on day of surgery, this is another 30 second activity. What do you think you might do differently during a multifocal case versus just a standard lens? Ready, go. <laughs> All right, 10 second warning. Okay, here we go. So um, this is one of my biggest points here, guys. Not that much, okay? So don't sit there and overthink it and be like, oh, I'm putting in a multifocal aisle and do a lot of things differently, right? Like almost in residency, just kind of like psych yourself out and be like, oh, I'm putting in a monofocal lens, whatever. Oh, those are rings on there. Hmm, that's weird, you know? So like if you can do that, the more you get out of your normal routine, the more you're gonna have errors, right? A um, couple things though, you wanna have good capsule coverage, right? So tilt is something that we don't want in multifocal IOLs. They're designed to be pretty planar. So if you have good capsule coverage, aiming, if you tend to be big, aim a little bit smaller. You don't want it super small because you can get that capsular contraction. So like don't go three millimeters, but like if you can get it around five, 5.5 5 max, that's gonna be great. Um, you do wanna polish the posterior capsule. If you can delay them having to have that PCO um, and having a YAG, they're a little bit more sensitive to getting those posterior capsular pacifications. And then you wanna have two lenses in the room, right? So if that lens gets cracked when folding and you don't have it on consignment, that's gonna be a sad day. So, um, and learn how to fold your own lenses, because then if the um, tech is, you know, not as good at folding them, cracks the first one, you'd be like, okay, my turn. And you know you're gonna be good at it. All right, um, so then after surgery, you're gonna have some discussions post-surgery, right? So here's um, one thing. So you have a 78-year-old male, it's one week post-op, uh, for the first eye, three weeks post-op for second eye. He's 20, 25, J1 near, and he's like, eh, things are still a little fuzzy. There's our halos around lights. Um, take, you know, 15 seconds and say what you would say to this patient. Ready, go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Okay, 10 second warning here. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to bring you guys back in. Um, so I heard a lot of good things. I'm glad you guys are talking about this. You will have this discussion. Like, this is going to happen in your career, right? Um, so what I say a lot of times is uh, the eye healing is about two to four weeks. The brain adaptation is about two to three months. And you need both eyes working together with that. I think that your brain will get more used to it. Um, and then you will see some of that glare halo, but it'll get less over time. Um, the other thing I talk about a little bit is the dry eye. So that can really affect multifocals a lot. So I say, hey, you're going to ride this wave. It's going to be really good sometimes. It's going to be not as good sometimes. And sometimes that's like 30 minutes apart. So ride that wave and just know it will get more consistent over time as you're using your post-op drops. And as you use some of these, you know, you can give them some artificial tears. So just tell them it will get a little bit more consistent and that that takes time to brain adapt. And that's in studies. You know, neuroadaptation with multifocal IOLs takes time. Depends on the person. Now, say there's someone that's like this. Right? So post up month two, 2030, J3. Uh, they're like, I think I'd rather wear readers than deal with this lens. Okay? Uh, 30 seconds. Ready? Go. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, let's bring it back in here. Okay, so with this patient, um, I heard some really good things. Anyone want to share? Would you talk about Iowa Exchange? Would you be nervous about talking about that? Catherine, do you want to share something? Or Yeah. Yeah, I think that we talked about how we would, um, or I would start to like start to like introduce the concepts of an IOL exchange, but really talk about risk benefits. Tell them, you know, it's not as simple as a primary cataract surgery. Um, and then Dr. Seibel brought up a great point of what I do exchange first in this patient if they want an IOL exchange. Yeah. Do you have any uh, pearls on that? How is the port dominant? Yeah. I'm waffling about uh, you know losing ear vision. Uh, you know, give them a good distance vision and they're going to eye and they're going to realize, wow, I lost my ear vision. Wow, I want to visit this other eye. Uh, that's such a great pearl. Start with the dominant eye, because that's the one also that they'll pay most attention to, all of those dysphotopsias, glare halo and stuff. And often they'll tolerate it in their near eye if you do their distance. So um, I would say learn how to do an IOL exchange. You know who's really good at this is Mifflin. He's just really careful. Um, and you have to be careful. So my pearls on that would be free up the haptics like until you're super like 150% convinced that they're free. Okay, because you don't want to tear zonules. That lens will kind of scar, and especially where that you know haptic optic junctures is. If it's a like a BNL lens, which they don't you know do the multifocal stuff as much here, but they have that little eyelet that can find most in between. Like you just got to be careful when you're doing an ILO exchange. Make sure it's super free. Then you dial it into the AC and don't mess with the endothelium. The cornea surgeons won't like you, right? So don't drag that lens right across the endothelium when you're taking it out. Um, I like twisting out. I like uh, bisecting the lens. You should probably learn how to do a couple of different methods of taking it. Out. Um, okay. Oh, and uh, I was just going to say, so frequency, you're going to do it, right? You're going to do ILO exchanges. So I've done, I was counting up my cases. I don't know if this is super accurate. I'm rounding up a little bit. But so I've been in nine months in private practice. I've probably done 500 cataracts, maybe like 120 multifocals or 100 multifocals. -ish, and I've taken out one or two this year. One, the lady ended up um, being more myopic than she wanted to. I think Tony, oh, he's not here. He was for, here for that case. Um, and so we actually moved her out a little bit in her dominant eye, and she liked that. The other one, the lady didn't like the, she was kind of like this situation. We put in a DI boost, so she still got a little bit of range, um, which is almost an EDOP, but didn't quite meet the criteria, which is great for you guys. Um, and we put it in, she was really happy. So, um, okay, last things. These are my kind of pearls because I know I have to wrap up. 
so with the objective subjective, that's the stuff at the bottom. If you're not good at evaling things and not looking at the OCT Mac and stuff, like if you put garbage in, garbage will come out, right? So make sure you have a good system. Practice this at the VA, because a lot of times you're going to be doing the you know eval, and it might be a PGY2 or PGY3 that's kind of counseling and stuff. So practice this. Uh, when you talk to a patient about what their priorities are, um, with VA patients, in general, if they're a healthy, you know, not AMD, you know, glaucoma vet, they're not super picky and they can do really well with multifocal IOLs. So um, they're not driving parleys at night most times, right? They're not night skiing. They're not like kind of that crowd, right? So um, a lot of VA vets, they'll tell me like, oh, I like to read some. I like to watch TV. I kind of like, you know, do whatever. Um, finally, yeah, know how to take things in, know how to take things out. Um, this is my first lecture to residents <clears throat> at Moran, so I just had to put a piece in real quick, and then I'll uh, turn the time over to the true expert. Um, just a word on self-care. So this is Will West. I went to high school with him um, and went to college with him, a good friend. If you don't know about his story, he took his life about three months ago. Um, so just a word about residency. Residency is challenging. It's really hard, guys. Don't feel bad if you feel like it's hard. Um, it's really, really important to engage in self-care. For me, um, and in kind of the studies, that means meaningful work. So find the things that you do like about your job, because there are things that are hard in residency that we probably all don't like, and lean into that. Um, meaningful play. So you got to like give yourself some time outside of work where you're doing something that you like to do. Um, relationships with family, with significant others and stuff, prioritize those. Call your mom, call your dad, call your girlfriend, like whatever you're doing. Um, and reflection. Like, if you don't keep a journal, maybe a note in your phone, something about where you can vent about like a bad day, a good day, that type of thing, right? Um, if you feel like you're in a cycle of negativity or self-doubt or anything, don't wait. Please don't wait. Don't let it linger. Um, I like this quote, it's, and um, there's some resources down at the bottom, but basically if you text scrubs to 741741, it's like a doctor line for mental health, uh, suicide prevention, also this uh, national uh, NPSD day as a toolkit that talks about um, that type of stuff. Um, I like this quote, when you talk with someone, treat them as if they're in serious trouble and you'll be right more than half the time. So statistically, like I'm not you know, saying, hey, this might be, but statistically there's someone in this room that's been dealing with this like this week. So if that's you or if that's a friend that you have, please reach out to them. Um, we're really, you know, the Lorna Breen Foundation is trying to prevent stuff like this. And uh, it just affects more people than we know. So take care of yourself. Um, one fast, last personal anecdote. I remember being on a certain rotation. Who's on consults? They're gone, right? Um, oh, okay. Oh, gosh. So on con being on consults and being like, man, after like a long day, I hate my job. But like, I like ophthalmology and I like patients, but like, why do I hate my job? Um, and that is okay to feel that way, right? Um, and just a picture of it does kind of get better over time. I remember one lecturer came and lectured and was like, when you get to be an attending, you're just as busy and it's like super hard. And I was just like, you dummy. It's not like that's not true. Tell me the last time you were on call on Christmas. Like, I was like, that, that's not true. So, just so you know, for a perspective, not to be like, oh, hey, look at my job, but like, I work four days a week. I have Fridays off. I coached my two kids' soccer teams this past year. I am on call two weeks a year, and that's like one or two calls a day. I maybe see like a patient a day. It's not like Moran call. Um, and I love my partner that's in my practice. Um, and I feel like I have a lot better balance. Um, and so it is a temporary time where you're gonna feel really unbalanced and like you're putting a lot of time into residency as you should because it's also one of the best times in your life. You'll operate a ton, you'll learn a ton, your like, learning curve and growth is crazy, but um, just know that it's, it, it does get a lot more balanced after residency. So that's all, I'll get off my soapbox now, but um, hang in there, you guys are awesome and uh, I'll turn the time over. Okay, thank you so much, Mike. That was awesome. I love the cases and the discussion and everything. So we're so lucky to have had you here with us. So next up we have kind of our keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Barry Seibel, who is our new or relatively new adjunct uh, faculty here. He literally wrote the book on phaco dynamics. So we're really, really excited to have him here and have the opportunity to learn from him um, and also just collect you know, all his pearls and um, literally hear it from the person who knows 
quite a bit on this subject. So with that, uh, help, help me uh, welcome Dr. Seibel. <laughs> oh, yes. And while we're in the transition, please get more food. Please get more drink. Um. Catherine, thank you. Uh, I am uh, genuinely honored to be here uh, and, and, and you know, joining your group. Uh, I've been uh, just uh, admired so much, uh, Randy Olson, and um, <coughs> for, for so many years, decades, uh, for the vision of, of building a center that first and foremost, you know, concentrated and, and, and stressed teaching, stressed patient care. And the research and the, the papers are all world class, but the, 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 the teaching and patient care that stood out so much is why you know, all of you are here and why the, the residency program never has to dip you know, more than you know, 10, 10 down in the list of 600 applicants to, to, get, you know, to get their top choices. So happy to be here, happy to talk about this subject, uh, whereby I want you to, um, I, I want you to break the, uh, the, the, the tradition for surgeons, uh, the, uh, uh, what would be considered an oxymoron, a thinking surgeon, because uh, uh, all of you are, got, are that. I want it to be even more so with this. When I was training in, in cataract surgery a uh, long time ago, uh, learning FACO, I was frustrated by the fact that I was shown what to do and not told why, why we were doing it. And when I would ask a question, well, why are you going to max fast, min slow, early terms with early FACO machines? Nobody knew. We were just sort of muddling our way through it. Uh, Everything happens for a reason in surgery, and so the more you understand the principles on which the equipment, the machines are based, as well as even some of the fundamental mechanics and physics of the, uh, the maneuvers themselves and how the instruments are constructed, you can intelligently perform surgery step by step with a minimum of force inside of the eye, minimum likelihood for complication caused by extraneous force that wasn't needed in the first place, uh, and adapt to virtually any surgical situation. Uh, financial disclosures. Uh, Howard Fine would always say, if you know more companies, please let me know. <clears throat> so let's just go through a, a routine FACO here. Uh, I use a, a chopping method. I like to uh, evacuate the anterior uh, epinucleus first. <clears throat> And this is with a standard pedal on very uh, low settings of, of ultrasound and, uh, and vacuum and flow. Uh, so I'm going to use a, a, a vertical chopping technique. I'm going to bury the uh, FACO needle with ultrasound and then uh, using a vacuum alone without ultrasound, grip the uh, uh, nucleus so that I can then insert the vertical chopper uh, and you know, create a crack. And if, what I want to stress about this, if you notice, there's very, very light manipulation. Uh, the cataract should look like it's just falling apart. You want to, uh, to correctly use parameters, correctly um, you know, translate your instruments so there's minimum extraneous force. And if you do that, the pieces should just fall apart. If you find that you're struggling and straining, something's wrong. You have to stop and think, well, why am I having to use all this force? Here I'm using vacuum to gently engage uh, fragments, pull them somewhat centrally so I can get the horizontal chopper around the periphery. And you want to think about this <clears throat> as an extension of your hands. Uh, you can see that you know, I'm just you know, gently rotating. There's a reason we're rotating exactly how we're doing, but just reaching out and grabbing a piece, grabbing, pulling it centrally, uh, you know, and, and evacuating it. Everything should proceed smoothly, gently. Um, we'll uh, go a little bit more forward in there, and we'll go into more detail later. And finally, when, we, when we've done the nucleus, you know, we're going to use different settings now for the epinucleus. And again, you want to think in terms of your hand, your fingers. I'm reaching in. I'm just grabbing that. I don't want to just use so much vacuum that I'm pulling a chunk out. You're always thinking of your next step. And here, I want to grab that with just enough force so that I can pull the whole epinuclear bowl, invert it, using my uh, uh, chopper. The curved surface is a, one of the Greek tools. Uh, it's a pulley. Uh, and, uh, and pull that around so I get the subincisional cortex out. So again, all 
all of this is an extension of your hands. How can I reach out and grab something, use the appropriate parameters for manipulation, grabbing, repositioning, and then how do you change those parameters for evacuation of the material that you've manipulated into the position you want so you're not evacuating it next to the capsule where it posed an additional danger. So think in those terms of, you know, how, how do you translate that? Uh, David Chang was very kind to write the forward to the, the fourth edition of my book, and I, I hate reading slides, but I'm going to read this one because I, I think it's pertinent. He said, you know, when I first learned FACO as a resident in the early 80s, recognizing different functions of uh, pedal positions one, two, and three was the extent of his knowledge of FACO dynamics. Uh, he said, back then, you know, we're just sculpting away in continuous mode with a fixed panel of 100% ultrasound power, just hoping that, you know, we wouldn't FACO the iris or posterior capsule before the, uh, you know, the nucleus was magically gone. So you want a better better game plan than that. <clears throat> And this was the game plan for a long time. This is how I think you know, probably Nick and, and I and uh, Randy learned uh, FACO, <clears throat> these enormous tables that were compilations of experienced surgeons writing down what they found was useful. Uh, who was it? Dave Dillman had the quote, uh, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. Uh, so by trial and error, they came up with these settings for different sorts of nucleus, soft, moderate, hard, depending on you know, which uh, we're using a 15 degree <laughs> 15 degree tip, 30 degree tip, we're using a legacy, a centurion. And so you had all these permutations and you're all smart enough to get into you know, one of the most competitive residencies uh, and you could probably memorize all this. And the industry responded by giving you what supposedly we were asking for, which is more memories. I want memory number 63. I want memory number 89 for this particular setup. And you could do surgery that way. Uh, here's another example of that. Again, multiple permutations for you know, different situations. If you could remember, okay, which one, which combination was this? That's memory you know, 26. My challenge to you is to think beyond that. Don't think in terms of memory. Think in terms of understanding. Think in terms of what do I want to accomplish and what's going on based on what I'm seeing through the microscope and what do I need to adjust and in what direction? And so you want to think about that so it becomes intuitive, just as intuitive as just reaching out and grabbing something. You want the machine and the equipment to be an extension of, of your hand, like, like any surgical tool. Uh, the principles, of course, are in the textbook. This is the least important slide in the, in the entire uh, talk. You have to start somewhere. So this gives some ranges where, where you may want to start. The, the key to the talk is where do you go from there? Probably the most important thing on, on this slide is what we're seeing is an evolution here. <clears throat> and we used to have bottle height that would pressurize the anterior chamber, but we're now finally seeing an anterior chamber surgery and, and phaco surgery is a migration from the uh, posterior segment where they would they wouldn't depend on that. They would actually set an IOP and the machine would try to, you know, to maintain that. And so we're actually seeing that now. Rather than just setting a bottle height, we're setting an intraocular pressure. So uh, that's been a big advance. Uh, and the other thing we'll go into more detail later is this use of the term hyperpulse for ultrasound. You should always have that. It's present on every machine. You want to make sure it's engaged and we'll talk about why. So to understand uh, FACO, I find it useful to just look at the, at the whole schematic of what's going on. It's a fluid, if, it's actually kind of like an electrical circuit. So you have this irrigating bottle that either through its height or through active pressurization uh, is uh, through an irrigation line and you know, through the handpiece and through irrigation ports is pressurizing uh, the anterior chamber. It's not creating flow, it's pressurizing. Um, and then you have an aspiration port at the end of the FACO needle that will evacuate material. Uh, if it's soft enough, it'll evacuate evacuate just by a pressure differential alone. If it's not soft enough, like a cataract or harder, then you have to disrupt that material so that it can be evacuated by, by that pressure. It's pulled through the handpiece, through the aspiration line, and it's being pulled by some kind of pump. And the other goal I have for today is, for, is to break through a lot of pre-existing misconceptions that have propagated through the decades about different kinds of pumps with magical properties of uh, a, a peristaltic pump does this, a uh, venturi pump does this. The aspiration port has absolutely no idea what kind of pumps at the other end. All it knows is fluids being pulled and the different type of pump and different kind of control algorithm determines what pressure and in what way will that pressure be continued depending on what's happening at the tip. That's what you need to learn about control algorithms, not the particular pump type. Any pump can mimic another pump. So again, that, that's something that we, we've got to break through because you're going to find that in and presentations and certainly in the industry. A lot of myths being propagated and we want to dispel those. 
standard FACO pedal. This was a problem we were talking about last night uh, at you know a recent wet lab. You know, residents, uh, one of the companies at great expense, you know, had all these machines flown in so the residents could use them, but they were just randomly programmed. They were programmed differently. The residents didn't have any presentation on you know how the basic foot pedal worked, and they were just said, "Well, here, play with some eyes," and the, no idea of you know what was what they're trying to accomplish, what feedback there was, and so again, you want to understand you you have to understand what your control inputs are going to mean in terms of clinical outputs. Nothing can be random. You want to have a meaningful expectation of a clinical output depending on what you're giving as a control input. So uh, many of you know this. Uh, but you know, you, there you know the three ranges here, and a position at the top. Position zero, everything's static. Uh, let's go back here. Uh, position zero, there's a solenoid here that simply clamps off on the aspiration line, so it uh, it separates this pressure head from this elevated bottle, so it's not presented to the anterior chamber. The anterior chamber is not pressurized. When you step into range one, you open the solenoid and you simply expose the anterior chamber to that elevated bottle pressure head, or you simply engage that uh, function on the machine if it's pressurized uh, um, uh, irrigation. Again, irrigation is sort of a poor term. Irrigation makes you think that there's a flow, and there's not. Position one, or range one, because there's a range of movement, is pressurization. There, there's no flow here. The only time a flow starts is when you, the pedal steps into range two, and now you have pump function. That's what range two is. The pump is functioning. It's pulling on the fluid. Uh, and we're going to learn how the different pumps work and how it pulls. But Range is relevant here because we have the luxury of linear control, which, uh, again, when Nick and I trained, we didn't have. You, you stepped on the pedal and it pulled. That was it. You can now adjust the range. So I can have low pulling to high pulling as I step through this range, or linear control. Uh, similarly, for range three, which is ultrasound, you can also have linear control. You can go from low ultrasound to high ultrasound as you step through that range. A limitation of this standard pedal configuration, though, is sometimes, and we're going to find out when, you may want to have medium level of, of fluidics or, or uh, flow or vacuum and medium level of ultrasound. Whereas with this pedal configuration, a standard pedal, once you've traversed low to high fluidics or vacuum and flow, and you then start to go into ultrasound, you're stuck with the highest range of fluidics. And so it, it's almost impossible to get a medium amount of fluid in an ultrasound. And we're going to find out why you would want that and what the limitation of a standard pedal is. Again, the, you know, just critical importance for you to understand how does the machine function? How do your control inputs function? What are you doing when, when you're moving the pedal? And a great way to do this, and we're going to do it in the, in the wet lab, is to, as you're moving the pedal, use but not only proprioceptive feedback of where your foot is, but visual feedback uh, looking at the panel to see what is your foot doing? How is it increasing flow or vacuum? And you want to be able to remember that because, of course, you're not going to be seeing the panel in the, uh, in the microscope, although they're, they're experimenting with some heads-up displays for that. But you've got to have a feeling for as you're moving the pedal and listening to the tone of the machine, which changes according to the, the fluidic uh, that you're commanding, what's happening inside of the eye. So what are the clinical roles of fluidics? And again, to me, this is the important part. What are, what are we actually accomplishing inside of the eye as we're changing these parameters? Well, flow, which is going to be aspiration outflow, uh, it's going to be measured in cc's or milliliters per minute, uh, is what gets material to the aspiration port inside of the eye, creating a current inside of the eye, pulling material to it. Um, Vacuum, which is going to be measured in millimeters of mercury, is a pressure differential. It's what grips the material to the port that was brought there by, by flow in the first place. Um, and it's gripped with a force proportional to the amount of vacuum you're commanding. We're going to find out clinically you know, why that matters. Bottle height, uh, just gravity in, in centimeters, and as, as we've just talked about more recently, active pressurization is what maintains an adequate inflow pressure, not flow, but pressure that keeps the chamber formed despite both a steady state outflow that you're going to set at the beginning of the case is adequate for that case based on the incision and everything else, and that has enough extra headroom such that it'll mitigate surge or collapse of the chamber when there's a sudden outrush of fluid, and we're going to be seeing some examples of that. Thank <laughs> you.
what's the clinical role of ultrasound? Well, we talked about that you're going to aspirate material from the eye, and if it's soft enough, sometimes it'll aspirate, like viscoelastic, that'll aspirate by, by just vacuum alone. But if it's any sort of nucleus, it's going to have to be disrupted sufficiently so that that vacuum and pressure differential can break it down sufficiently to fit within the aspiration line and, and be moved out of the eye. Uh, so this disruption destabilization, destabilization of the nuclear material not only allows aspiration of, of lens material, but it equally important allows us to embed the phaco tip into the cataract such that we can then apply vacuum to grip it. Remember we talked about this extension of your hand. We want to grab the material, either manipulate it in the eye, rotate it, bring it away from the posterior capsule, away from the pupil, to where we want it uh, for further manipulation, such as chopping or aspiration. So uh, the ultrasound allows us to, uh, to apply that vacuum, which unless we had the tip completely buried, wouldn't be able to effectively apply. And we're going to see some examples of that. So depending on what you're doing, uh, what technique you're using at, at, at a given time, it will drive what phacodynamic uh, goals are. So sculpting. Well, in sculpting, you just want to you know, dissolve the cataract with the ultrasound that's correlated to the nuclear density. You know, you, you want to use just enough to accomplish your goal, but, but not more than that. You don't want to, anytime you use more of a parameter than what's clinically required, you're introducing a likelihood for either uh, uh, postoperative morbidity from inflammation or a com intraoperative complication, and you did it for no reason. If you didn't clinically need that higher parameter, don't use it. So again, recognize the function of the parameter. Use enough, but not more than enough. Uh, so when you're sculpting, you're creating an emulsate inside of the eye. That needs to be evacuated. If it weren't, well, your eye fills up with phaco dust. You can't see what you're doing. And that, that becomes dangerous. Uh, and not only do you want to remove it, you want to always have a flow during ultrasound. Ultrasound means the needle's vibrating. If there's vibration, there's friction. If there's friction, there's heat. If you don't have a turnover of fluid, that's when you have a potential complication of, of a wound burn. And so you always need to be keeping that in your mind, uh, and we'll see an example of that. If, if you see a, a phaco a dust accumulating, that means ultrasound's acting in the absence of outflow, and you have a potential problem. You have to stop immediately, figure out what's wrong, <clears throat> and not continue with ultrasound because likelihood is you will have a burn. <clears throat> so... What if you're doing something different? What if we're not sculpting? What if we're chopping? Well, we have different phacodynamic goals. Now, as we talked about, when we embed the uh, phaco needle into the, the cataract, we want an adequate grip of that so that we can effectively use a chopping instrument to subdivide it into smaller fragments. Smaller fragments are always more efficiently uh, phaco aspirated in a carouseling fashion than, than larger fragments, and that's uh, the essence of chopping. Again, we correlate vacuum to nuclear density, and we're going to find out this is one of the key parts of the talk, optimize aspiration port vacuum seal. Um, as we're using higher vacuums, we need to we need to recognize and control surge, post occlusion surge, and we're going to find a number of ways of doing that. In chopping, and really in any kind of technique, we also have to first and foremost understand mechanical advantage. We have to understand the basis of the technique. We have to understand the construction of the instruments. We have to understand how to effectively apply that construction toward the methodology of the, of the techniques so that the instruments are properly placed initially and equally important translated appropriately. Uh, and we're going to show in chopping how that can go well or, or, or not well. So. Two kinds of basic pumps on the market, and again, you're going to hear a lot of misconceptions about them. Let's talk about them, understand them, and then understand how it's almost arbitrary that either one can mimic the other. So they're flow pumps and vacuum pumps. Flow pumps, typical peristaltic pump. If you, any of you have rotated through a, a, you know, general surgery and you've seen a dialysis machine or you've seen the, you know, a heart-lung machine, uh, you see the peristaltic uh, roller heads running, uh, rolling over tubing, pumping fluid. So in a flow pump, surgeon commands a flow rate, milliliters or cc's per minute. The surgeon sets a vacuum limit. They don't command a vacuum. They set a vacuum limit in millimeters of mercury. And what that means is that uh, you set the flow rate, and then if there's a, a, a occlusion of the aspiration port, vacuum will build. You're telling the machine at what point to stop building vacuum, stop, uh, you know, stop, stop the pump. But you're not saying what vacuum to actually create, and then that's, a, that's a critical difference. Easy way to remember this, flow pump maintains flow as vacuum varies. So here's a typical schematic. Uh, the aspiration line is simply draped over the, this rotating pump head. The aspiration line, of course, isn't moving. When you set flow rate, what you're really setting, and again, this is really useful on understanding equipment, you're not necessarily 
setting what the flow is going to be, what you're setting is the rotational speed of the pump head. Uh, so if you know, you're setting it slow, it's going to rotate slowly. If you're setting fast, it's going to rotate quickly. Does that mean more, there's more flow? Not necessarily. What determines that? Aspiration port, status of the aspiration port. That's going to be one of the key elements of this I'm going to come back to over and over. That's going to influence the clinical outcome of any sort of control input you give. So if this is rotating really quickly and the aspiration port's not occluded, yeah, you're going to have more flow. What if the aspiration port is occluded and it's rotating more quickly? You're going to build vacuum more quickly. If it's rotating slower, you're going to build vacuum more slowly. And you want that clinical control depending on what you're doing at the time, the status of the patient. If, they, uh, if it's a normal case or is it a compromised case, uh, weak zonules, uh, uh, previous traumatic cataract, myopic eye, you may want to have a slower flow rate so that you have more time to react as pressure or, or vacuum is building. Here is a very, very old video. Uh, let's see if we can uh, click play here. Had brown hair, had hair. Uh, this is an old parasaltic machine. And so we're going to look at the panel here. Look at the drip chamber. And this is the peristaltic pump turning. The flow rate's very low here. There's vacuum set. Preset is high, but there's no vacuum. As I increase the flow rate, you can see more rapid drip in the anterior chamber. Here the pump's turning quickly at 40 cc's a minute and rapid uh, uh, dripping here. So we'll simulate an occlusion by simply pinching off the aspiration line. And let's see what happens in terms of rise time. So when I pinch off the aspiration line, look how slowly vacuum is building as the pump keeps working until it hits the preset. Once it hits the preset, it'll stop. Now, if I have a fast flow rate, look how much more quickly the vacuum builds up. So it's called rise time. So shorter rise time if you have a faster flow rate. And again, there's no flow once you've pinched off the aspiration line. You have an occlusion, but the pump head is turning more quickly, so it's building vacuum more quickly. So again, that's what you're controlling. Other main kind of pump, vacuum pump. Uh, typically a Venturi, but there are uh, electric vacuum pumps out there. Doesn't matter how you build the vacuum, I'll show you how it's constructed and, and more importantly, how it's controlled. So you remember in a flow pump, flow, the surgeon controls the flow rate and there's a vacuum limit. In a vacuum pump, you're actually commanding the vacuum level. You're telling the machine, I want you to produce this level of vacuum. Uh, also, if you look at the machine, there's no flow rate anywhere on it. You don't see a flow control anywhere on the panel of a typical vacuum a pump machine. However, turns out clinically, of course we can control flow. So a vacuum pump maintains the commanded vacuum as flow varies. Remember, just the opposite of what we just learned about a flow pump. So here's a typical schematic of a vacuum pump. There's some sort of pump here that produces a vacuum or pressure differential connected to a rigid drainage cassette. If you've ever looked at an old, older uh, um, uh, flow pump machine, you'll typically see a flexible drainage pouch. If you had a flexible pouch on a vacuum pump, it wouldn't work because when you apply vacuum to it, it would, it would just collapse. Uh, so you have a rigid cassette and you apply vacuum here and so there's a pull on the fluid inside the aspiration line to which this you know, drainage chamber is connected and the harder you pull, the faster the flow rate because you're pulling the fluid harder. But that's only if what? Faster flow rate if you pull harder on the fluid, if what? I think I heard the, heard the answer in back. So if, if the aspiration port isn't occluded, the key to what's going on clinically inside of FACO is the aspiration port. Is it occluded or not? Because that's going to affect your control input. You can have a completely different clinical output. So if the aspiration port isn't occluded and you're pulling harder on the fluid, you're gonna have a faster flow rate. If it is occluded, what's happening? You're just gripping harder to whatever you held on to. Can you keep going forever? No, uh, there's a limit based on the nuclear density and you're gonna figure that out, not based on a table that you saw in a textbook or my lecture, but what you see through the operating microscope. That's your feedback. Your visual feedback is going to drive your control inputs at the, uh, uh, at the pedal and uh, your settings on the machine. So let's see what a vacuum pump looks like. So we're pulling fluid, aspiration port's not occluded, notice the vacuum's a little higher in the cassette than inside the eye. As I increase vacuum inside of the cassette, I'm pulling harder on the fluid. I have a much faster flow rate. The irrigating bottle tells me what's going on inside of the eye, by the way. Also notice the vacuum inside the eye is not as high as, or inside the tip is not as high as inside the cassette. Now we pull a fragment to the tip, vacuum immediately equilibrates. And now the vacuum is the same both 
you know, inside the, the tip applied to the fragment. And if I want to uh, adjust the vacuum or the grip, it's a one-to-one -one adjustment. They're the same at this point. It's, it's a fixed closed system from the pump to the occlusion. The problem, and I think the bad reputation that, um, that Venturi pumps had through the years was this equilibration, once you have an occlusion, is almost instantaneous for a couple of reasons. Number one, people say, well, it's live vacuum. Well, it's true, but it's not in the eye. It's not at the tip. It's back at the, at the machine. However, there's a, a term that we're going to look at later on called compliance. And it, uh, compliance is a change in volume over a change in, in pressure. And typically, vacuum pumps have a lower compliance system. They have stiffer tubing that has less, less give to it. And so it doesn't take long, usually a fraction of a second, for vacuum to equilibrate between the machine and an occlusion. And so that could be scary to surgeons used to a peristaltic machine that, remember, it, it wasn't commanding vacuum, wasn't building vacuum. Once there's an occlusion, it starts to build vacuum. So typically, in older machines with lower, compli lower compliance, um, higher compliance, excuse me, <clears throat> It took a lot, lot longer to build vacuum. And so surgeons, I think, felt a certain safety in that, or at least that was the norm for them. So if they abruptly switched to a, a vacuum pump, they could be surprised by, wow, that vacuum was there immediately. You can adjust all of that. And so again, we're, we're going to learn how to and why, again, the myths are arbitrary. You can adjust the equipment, not only can, but have to. You, you, you as the surgeon are obligated to adjust it to where it's performing the way you want it to. So let's look at another example. This is an interesting machine that can run either way. You can do flow or vacuum. So here I've set a vacuum of 20 milliliters of mercury. You can see a certain flow rate there. Or I can set a flow rate, and I end up with exactly the same drip in, in the drip chamber, which is the current inside of the uh, eye. So here I'm setting a higher vacuum, 200, and you see a much faster flow rate here. I can get the same flow rate by just setting using a flow control, uh, setting the flow at 50 or a vacuum at, commanded vacuum at 200. So I can use vacuum mode or flow mode. And again, this is just a schematic of the same thing. So it's kind of arbitrary. You can set either machine. What you as a surgeon are concerned about is what current do you have inside of the eye? Do you want a fast current or a slow current? Depending on the case, you'll have different clinical goals. Um, and of course, once there's an occlusion, then it really doesn't matter. Uh, modern machines, compliance is relatively uh, low, and you're going to get a pretty similar rise time no matter what you're using. And this is just showing uh, rise time. When you get an aspiration, or when you get an occlusion, just important to understand, flow in the eye should stop. Also, at this point, the chamber may deepen because you're not pulling fluid out anymore, and now you have simply the um, unequilibrated pressure head from the irrigating bottle that's pressurizing the eye, so the chamber may deepen unless uh, you have a newer version of the machine that actually monitors IOP and will try to, to maintain a constant IOP or chamber depth. This is an important slide. So the, this is what, figure 27A in the textbook. What this underscores is that the t everything at the top is a flow pump algorithm. Everything at the bottom is a vacuum pump algorithm. So it underscores the fact that, number one, there's only a single parameter that we're controlling with a vacuum pump. That is commanded vacuum as opposed to two parameters with a flow pump, uh, commanded flow and a vacuum limit. But it also underscores that the critical nature of the aspiration port occlusion and noting that whether it's occluded or not, gives you a different clinical output for your control input. And so again, as surgeons, you have to understand going into the room, do you have a flow pump or a vacuum pump or a flow or vacuum command algorithm? Because again, you can do this with either pump. And what's going on at your aspiration port? Because that's going to determine the clinical output uh, or the clinical effect for your control input at the pedal. So you have to anticipate that. In fact, you have to say, OK, I want this to happen. You have to understand that, well, if I press down here and the aspiration port's occluded, this is the clinical effect I'll get. I, I'll get a grip. I'll get an attraction of material to the port. So you want to be able to intelligently do that and not, never randomly. So let's put this into a, a schematic. Let's say uh, we have a chopped fragment, and we simply want to attract it to the, uh, to the aspiration port. So there's a current inside of the eye uh, formed by irrigation coming out through the irrigation ports here, circulating through the eye, and being pulled back into the aspiration port. So this is going to draw the material to the tip. The strength with which we're drawing, or the speed with which we're drawing, is simply a function of how rapid the current is, how, how strong the current is. So if we look over at this panel on the machine, this uh, 
green bar might represent the commanded vacuum back at the uh, uh, back of the machine if we we're using a vacuum algorithm or a vacuum pump. The actual vacuum inside the tip is much lower because there's no occlusion, and the degradation of the vacuum from the pump to the tip simply goes into driving that flow. In fact, if you, you have the machine here and the aspiration port here that's unoccluded, and you spike the aspiration line at different levels, uh, you'll simply see a steadily, you know, almost an arithmetically lower uh, vacuum at each point because that's going into driving that flow. <clears throat> if you have a peristaltic pump, this panel will look pretty much the same. You'll have a vacuum limit that you may have set at this green. And again, let's arbitrarily, let's put some numbers there. Let's say this is zero at the bottom, 400 at the top. And we're saying, well, we want a, a vacuum limit of 200. Well, again, there's no actual vacuum inside the tip because you've set a flow rate and it's giving you that flow, uh, but there's, there's very little vacuum being built up here. So let's look here. Now we have the fragment to the tip, which is what we wanted. And it's partly occluding the aspiration port. So whatever surface area we had before in the aspiration port has now significantly reduced. So now the pump's trying to pull fluid through a much smaller opening. There's higher resistance to flow. Because of that higher resistance, we see there's a lot more vacuum built up here as the pump is trying to overcome that resistance. It's pulling harder to try to get that same flow that you commanded as a surgeon through there. Uh, so vacuum's rising, but it hasn't hit the preset limit. It hasn't hit, that's if it's a flow pump. If it's a vacuum pump, it hasn't equilibrated back with the machine. Uh, there, there's still this, this gap here. So now, it depends what is your clinical goal. What are you trying to accomplish? Well, add the fragment to the tip. What do I want to do? Well, you might want to phaco aspirate it. You might want to engage ultrasound and at this point start to aspirate the material such that the ultrasound breaks it down sufficiently so that the vacuum and flow can you know, aspirate and remove it from the eye. Perfectly valid goal. What if you have a different clinical goal? What if you decide, well, if I chop that into two smaller fragments, they would each more efficiently feed into the, the aspiration port with carouseling phaco aspiration with less manipulation by a second instrument than otherwise would be required with a larger fragment. <clears throat> so with that in mind, you place your chopper here. You draw your chopper in the direction uh, with the, the vector force arrow shown by the, the green arrow here. You draw it toward the uh, phaco needle or the tip with the idea that I'm going to chop this into two smaller fragments. But what happens? This actually induces a torque if you're a little bit off axis here and that torque breaks the vacuum seal and you lose your grip and you've lost your control. You didn't complete the chop so you weren't holding on tightly enough. We back up a few slides and we remember, well, vacuum equates to grip. I, sh I should probably increase the vacuum. And that gets back to the, the second equally important part of the talk along with recognizing what's going on with your aspiration port. The other part that you always have to be thinking of is technique before technology always optimize everything you've done in terms of instrumentation, application, uh, where you're putting your instruments, how you're moving your instruments, that all has to be optimized before you ever turn to the parameters on the machine because you don't want to use the parameters on the machine as a crutch for bad technique whereby you're using a higher parameter than what you need at the risk that we talked about earlier. Likelihood for uh, you know, po uh, post-surgical uh, inflammation or intraoperative complications. So, and as you can see, it wouldn't change anything. So let's go back here. Let's say that we did raise the vacuum level. What happens? We move the green bar from here up to here somewhere. Does not change the clinical performance at all. So in order to get an effective grip, you have to occlude the aspiration port, which brings us to another myth. Uh, parasaltics, uh, you know, build, you need occlusion to build vacuum with a parasaltic. You don't need it to build with a venturi. Absolutely false, clinically. Now, again, the, your commanding vacuum with a venturi, it's back to the machine over here, does not matter in terms of what's going on at the aspiration port. Uh, at the aspiration port, there's not much vacuum. You have to occlude the aspiration port in order for vacuum to equilibrate between the machine and the, and the occlusion. So now you've got control. It's a closed loop. Now you have linear control. I'm, I'm changing vacuum on the machine, which you can do with a flow or a vacuum pump, and I'm changing the grip on the, uh, the material. With that complete occlusion, now the vacuum inside the tip matches what's at the pump, which is the, the, uh, the green line if you have a vacuum pump, or if it's a peristaltic pump, it builds up to that level and then stops. If you have a peristaltic pump, you'll hear uh, often an occlusion indicator, a bell, or whatever tone you've set that tells you, yep, I'm at that level now. So that means that that's the most vacuum I can get with that setting. 
what if it's not enough? We're gonna, I'll show you a video of what, what an example of that is. Well, that's when you have to go beyond the linear range you've set on your pedal and actually change the parameter range on the machine. But that's how you know. Again, not based on some arbitrary chart that I showed you, but based on what you see through the operating microscope, your visual feedback determines the parameter on the machine. So in a, in a, in a brief break from uh, fluidics, uh, we'll, we'll talk about ultrasound a little bit. Ultrasound, um, you can see this depiction of how ultrasound basically works. Traditional longitudinal ultrasound where the needle's uh, vibrating back and forth here <clears throat> as opposed to torsional. <clears throat> And we'll touch on that in a moment. But one of the basic differentiators in ultrasound as far as the equipment is the angulation of the tip. And you, you'll often hear about this. What degree tip do you use? Well, zero degree tip simply is you know, perpendicular cut here to the long axis of the needle. And here you see these progressive greater angulations from 15 to th uh, 45 where you see more of an angulation here. And again, this gets back to a traditional teaching, part of which is a myth. A zero degree tip occludes more easily. A 45 degree tip cuts better. The latter might be true. That actually might be an interesting lab study. Uh, but the former absolutely is not true. A zero degree tip does not occlude more easily. How do we find out? Well, let's look. And also let's define occ uh, occlusion. Before we do that, let's also look at some different designs of FACO needles. Uh, when Charlie Kelman invented FACO, it was with a 19 gauge standard needle. These are the dimensions on it. Uh, as uh, equipment has evolved, typically we've gone toward a smaller dimension so we can have a smaller incision. But the shapes vary. So here we're, we just in, decreased from a 19 to a 21 gauge and we've decreased the arc architecture, but it's the same same design. There are a number of needles that have this variable architecture with a larger distal opening and a, uh, a smaller shaft opening. Why would they do that? There are different reasons, but the important thing is there's a clinical implication of that. First, let's say we're just going from a standard 19 gauge needle to a standard 21 gauge. Well, fluidically, what's going on? Well, smaller diameter has a higher resistance to flow. You know, trying to, you know, uh, drink soda through a smaller straw, a cocktail straw versus a you know, milkshake straw. So with that higher resistance, that means fluid is going to flow out of the eye more slowly. Well, that's a good thing. So as far as anterior chamber stability, if fluid can rush out more slowly or can only rush out more slowly, you're less likely to have a chamber collapse or dimpling. Well, that's good. However, if force is uh, applied over a smaller surface area, that's less pressure. Uh, that means you have less grip. For a given amount of vacuum, you're going to have less grip on the nucleus, and you have to be able to anticipate that. And what may have worked for you before with a larger distal opening won't work the same with a smaller distal opening, and you have to be able to adapt with parameters accordingly. Why? So, so this kind of ties in with both that and this idea of better or worse occlusion. Well, here's a zero degree tip, and the cross-sectional area of the aspiration port is simply you know, pi r squared. You know, it's just you know, one radius. Uh, if you have any kind of angulation, you're going to have an oval cross-section with a cross-sectional area of pi times the short radius times the long radius, which by definition is going to be a bigger number than you know, a, a zero degree tip. So automatically you have more force applied for, or more pressure applied for a given amount of, of vacuum. We get confused because millimeters of mercury has a surface area uh, implied but not expressed. And so you can convert that to PSI or pounds per square inch. And, and that's more easy because if you have pounds over square inch uh, and you have more square inch of surface area, you know, the square inches cancel and you're left with pounds of force. So the more surface area you have, the more pounds of force you have. So it's, it's, it's a, direct, uh, a direct relation. So more angulated tip, more force. But the real difference I think is shown here. So first we have to define, well, what's a good occlusion? So I think it's when the aspiration port that you can see here is embedded the same amount across its entire surface area. And you can see that's true here for this zero degree tip. You also see it's true exactly the same for this 45 degree tip. Uh, the aspiration port's buried exactly the same amount. Let's look at these lower two diagrams in which for this part of the aspiration port to be embedded, uh, 
the same amount as it is across the entire aspiration port in the upper two diagrams, this part of it had to be buried five times deeper. That's five times more ultrasound energy, five times more chance for a wound burn, five times less time efficiency, because I had to get this that far in just to get this part the same amount as up here. You can see that's true for the 45 degree tip here, it's true for the zero degree tip here. What's the difference? It obviously isn't the tip. It's not the angulation of the tip. What, what's the difference that you see? I think. Yeah, it's the relation. It's the relationship of the uh, aspiration port, the plane of that, to the plane of the material that you're occluding. And to the extent that they are coplanar, that's when you're going to get an effective occlusion. To the extent they are not coplanar, you're not going to get an effective occlusion. So it's arbitrary what the tip is, and it's entirely dependent on you as a surgeon to make sure that you do get coplanarity and adjust so the, uh, the uh, rotation of the phaco needle as well as the angulation of the surface that you want to occlude so that you achieve this relationship for an effective occlusion. And here's an example of that. So before I start this, I want you to look at this panel here. You can see it flow rate here is 24, and you can see I've set a flow, but there's no actual flow because you don't see any LEDs because I haven't stepped on the pedal yet. Here's vacuum. I think it's at 200. And again, you see an LED here, but there's no, no um, LEDs underneath because we haven't built any vacuum. Once I start this, <clears throat> I want you to watch the panel and also watch the tip. This is a uh, stop, uh, stop and chop maneuver where we've grooved and divide the nucleus into two hemisections like uh, Howard Gimbel uh, described. And now we're going to embed the phaco needle into the one hemisection, as Paul Koch described, and stop and chop so that we can engage vacuum to pull the hemineucleus centrally to make it easier to get the phaco chopper around the periphery. So that there's our, that, that's our, uh, our base story. So let's go ahead and hit play. And so watch as I try to embed the phaco needle without respecting coplanarity. I embed it in. I can't go any further because the silicone sleeve's an impediment. And again, I'm going to bury it in there. And you can see what happens. Look at all the flow. I got lots of flow, but no vacuum. I can't build up vacuum because the aspiration port's still open to the anterior chamber fluid. And if I pull, I have absolutely no grip. If I now rotate the bevel 180 degrees so that now it aspiration port is coplanar with the surface of that hemineucleus, watch what happens when I re-engage into position three. As the tip buries, look at the hemineucleus just jump up onto the tip with applied vacuum, and you can see that the, uh, the flow has dropped to zero because I have complete occlusion, and my vacuum's jumped to the preset limit, and I'm able to effectively pull that large hemineucleus out with a strong, effective grip and get the chopper around it. I didn't change the parameters at all. They, they remain the same. I just optimized the technique. I made sure that I had a good aspiration port seal. I made sure that the aspiration port was coplanar with the surface I was trying to occlude. It was a night and day difference. This wasn't a parameter problem. This was a technique problem. Always remember, technique before technology. Optimize your technique. So how do you get a good aspiration port occlusion? Well, you want to be in the center, densest, most homogeneous part of the nucleus in terms of an anterior-posterior dimension. You want to embed an adequate amount, at least about a millimeter, millimeter and a half. You need to make sure the silicone sleeve is pulled back far enough to allow that. You want to make sure that you have a relatively tight uh, uh, fit there, and you do that by using just enough ultrasound energy to embed the tip, but not excessive ultrasound energy that would induce cavitation or excessive vacuum that, that might be higher than what that nuclear density can tolerate, such that it would erode the vacuum seal. And if you do all of those things, and then adjust vacuum accordingly without ultrasound, by the way, you need to make sure that if you're in a standard pedal, remember you've got three at the bottom, two up here. You need to make sure you're just up beyond three because if the needle's vibrating, you're not going to get an effective grip. It's a lot easier with, with dual in here, and we're going to go over that in a moment. But that, that's how you get an effective grip. Here's an exa examples of ineffective grip. So here, I'm so anterior that, again, the, I haven't even completely occluded the aspiration port. We're never going to build vacuum to the limit. We won't get an effective grip. Here, I'm deep enough to where I have completely occluded the aspiration port, but this softer material, uh, more peripheral, whether anterior or posterior, you definitely don't want to be too posterior, uh, but if, if you're not in the center, densest, most homogeneous part of the nucleus, the more peripheral material is more likely to break down and aspirate 
operate under a ultrasound or aspiration load such that once it breaks and you've broken your vacuum seal, again, you've lost your grip and control. <clears throat> Here's an example where I've completely occluded, and uh, I just haven't gone in nearly enough. Uh, barely gone, gone in a, a half millimeter. As soon as you start to manipulate, you're going to break your vacuum seal. You're going to lose your grip and control. And finally, here's an example where we've done everything right the way we've talked about, but we've now eroded the vacuum seal. And this would be an example of excessive ultrasound or excessive vacuum or both. And you'll know it as a surgeon because you're going to be looking right at it under the microscope. And you'll see that kind of a breakdown right at the tip under that excessive load. And you'll say, whoop, OK, that's too much. And you'll back off on either the ultrasound or vacuum. Again, not according to any slide I showed or any table in a book, but according to what you're seeing through the microscope. It's a direct link between what you're seeing visually and what your pedal is doing. It should be just a smooth, immediate reaction. <laughs> Ultrasound power modulations. So this is what happens when you're in position three, but in the olden days, where, where Nick and I trained, uh, if you're in position three, that's just that's what it did. You know, 80% power, 80% power. So power modulations mean that while you're in position three, the machine is doing some different things. And so in this case, it's turning ultrasound on and off really rapidly. Uh, so here's an example of pulse control, two pulses per second, 50% uh, duty cycle. So in one second, it, it's on for Ultrasound is on for a quarter second, off for a quarter second, on for a quarter second, off for a quarter second. Notice how in the upper diagram here, this shows the pedal being per pressed progressively more in position three. So that means I've retained linear control of power, which is absolutely critical. You never want to be without linear control of power. Uh, but that being said, we've got these on-off cycles. We're going to figure out why this is so important. Burst is a term that was really, again, I think it's been misused through the years. Burst came out, at least in the U.S., uh, with a machine called the Diplomax, made by OMS, which was purchased by AMO back, back in the day. Um, and it had this feature whereby the more you step down on the pedal, the more burst per second you get. So, for example, you know, when you're barely stepping into position three, you got this one brief burst per second and then nothing for the rest of the second. If you step down more in the pedal, you get more burst per second until finally all the way down in the pedal you have continuous phaco, which is, again, you almost never want. But also notice the flat line here. In original burst, you lost linear control of power, which, again, in my opinion, was like operating with your hand tied behind your back, a terrible compromise. But you'll hear that term burst a lot, and again, as it was originally used, this is it, you don't want it. Usually the way people use it now, it's really a variation of pulse where you do have this uh, uh, still control of, of linear power. Hyperpulse is an extenuation of pulse whereby you can, it, when pulse first came out, they arbitrarily decided well, we're going to have a 50% duty cycle. Hyperpulse simply means you can lower that to less. You can have a 25% duty cycle, meaning that you know for a given time interval, uh, the fake goes on only on 25% of the time, off 75% of the time. So why would you do this? We're going to see. This is a great uh, video by uh, Teruki Miyoshi. Uh, it was a grand prize uh, uh, winner at the film festival. Here's continuous at top, pulse mode, hyperpulse. And you can see this kind of mirrors what we did. And here you see these cavitation bubbles with high-speed videography uh, you know, with an off and on. Remember, the FACO pedal's on the whole time. The problem with continuous that I thought was very entertainingly shown by the football and, and also by these chestnuts, you can see the, the material's not feeding directly in. It's constantly being pushed away. In hyperpulse mode, during the off period, the fluidics can reseat the material such that the subsequent pulse of FACO is vastly more effective. But once it's something's being uh, attracted and gripped by vacuum, then when ultrasound hits it, vastly more effective, like chipping away at something held in a vise versus something that's free-floating. You hit with a hammer and it just moves away, which is what Dr. Miyoshi was showing here. Uh, let's see what else. Now, the other advantage of pulse is that during the off period, it gives time for thermal equilibration, less likelihood for a wound burn. So... I want you to watch right here at the tip what happens. I'm going to try to remove this anterior epinucleus, and almost immediately, look at this phaco dust building up. Now, here's slow motion. This happened really fast. And the moment I saw it, I stopped, but I can see the problem occurring right here. Look in the incision. There are bubbles here. Now, 
some people might say that's cavitation, and I would say no. You, for cavitation, you have to have a perpendicular wavefront or, or surface uh, uh, from uh, the direction of the uh, ultrasonic propagation. This is boiling water. That water is 40 degrees C right there because there's no outflow. We have ultrasound in the absence of cooling flow, and that's why it, we knew to stop, saying, well, that's trouble. And in fact, it was. Despite me stopping, and I timed it, it was about a second and a half, realizing there was a problem, already had a wound burn. You can see the characteristic fish mouthing down here and the opacification of denatured protein. So uh, hyperpulse will greatly lessen the likelihood that, that you'll ever get a wound burn. Nothing uh, guarantees that there won't be a quirk, but you can certainly diminish the, the likelihood. So these are the factors in uh, incisional burn. It's just friction, uh, ultrasound soothing. By the way, Ozil doesn't prevent it, or uh, uh, the White Star. Uh, you can still have a wound burn. Uh, in fact, that was Ozil uh, that, that you just saw. So you just you want you want to always try to be mitigating that. So use only as much ultrasound power as you need. Use a, uh, a modulation such as hyperpulse so that you have off periods for thermal equilibration as well as improved followability, uh, as we saw in the uh, the video. Uh, you want to have an infusion, the cross-sectional area of volume that's as big as possible. All that means is a bigger sleeve, so you have more fluid around the tip. Um, and you always have to be on the lookout for flow restrictions. Do you have excessive viscoelastic inside of the eye? Is your vacuum high enough to clear the viscoelastic? Remember we talked about goals and setting parameters? Well, when you're sculpting, you may not need as high a vacuum as you do for chopping, but you absolutely need enough vacuum to where it clears the viscoelastic so it doesn't occlude the tip and you continue to have aspiration flow. If you hear the occlusion indicator and you're sculpting and you see an open aspiration port, stop, something's wrong. Either something's wrong with the machine or simply you just don't have the vacuum set high enough. You have it set so low that the increased viscosity is causing enough resistance to where that's telling, it's allowing vacuum to build to your preset level that just wasn't high enough to overcome that. It's stopping the pump, but ultrasound's still going. So again, as a surgeon, you always wanna be on the lookout for that. Sculpting, by definition, is just not as efficient a mode of fake homulsification for several reasons. Number one, for a given amount of ultrasound energy delivered in your sculpting, by definition, you're not completely occluding the tip. You're only uh, aspirating a fraction of what you could as far as the, the internal volume of the needle as compared to occlusion phaco, where, of course, you're getting the whole volume of the needle. So time efficiency, uh, you want to minimize sculpting. You want to do maximum occlusion phaco. Also, you just want to understand how FACO works. So this is how pulsed FACO works. If you look at this upper diagram, when you engage a fragment and during the off period of, of, of a power modulation, there's no ultrasound, even though you're in position three, vacuum is being applied. And so that's shown by this red uh, area of the nucleus. So this is strain on, on, on the, uh, excuse me, stress on the nucleus. You're applying a vacuum. There's no deformation or change yet, but you're applying a stress to it. So. Uh, you're increasing the likelihood that when the ultrasonic burst occurs to material under stress, there's going to be a greater fracture and breakdown of the material, which happens here during the on period. You can see this breakdown of the material. During the next off period of that cycle, that's when the material that you just broke down will be aspirated, and more importantly, the material will reseat without being pushed away by ultrasound. So now that it's reseated here, we have the same thing as in the upper diagram. Now it's reseated, ready for the next you know, strike from, from ultrasound, from that power burst. That's why occlusion mode, hyperpulse phaco is gonna be your most efficient as far as time efficiency and least likelihood of wound burn. That, that's why you want it engaged. So let's move on to specifics about a technique. Let's say that we wanna do phaco chopping and we wanna apply all of these phaco dynamic principles. Let's see how to do that. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely look at the original uh, uh, Kunihiro Nagahara uh, Film Festival Grand uh, Prize winner on original horizontal chop. Brilliant. Uh, just, you know, caught us by surprise. Who would have thought? And, you know, that, that drove a whole, uh, a whole future of FACO. The way it was originally taught, though, it was challenging because it involved this very large instrument, like a Sinsky hook on steroids that uh, we had to place inside of the eye. We had to be careful not to place it on top of the anterior capsule. We had to be careful to place it just central to the capsular rexus. Then 
and we had to rotate this big instrument so that it was in iris plane so that it could slip under the anterior capsule. And once we got out to the periphery where often we couldn't see because it was beyond the pupil margin, then we had to rotate it back so it would be effectively be used for chopping. And we had to you know, worry about, well, gosh, it wasn't a sharp tip, but it was sure a small, small tip, and it was right next to the posterior capsule. So that led to a relatively slow adoption of horizontal chop, despite it you know, being a brilliant technique. So along comes Paul Koch, who said, well, wait a minute, what if we use, you know, phacodynamic principles, we engage, we, first we, we create hemi-nuclei, we do a gimbal divide and conquer, we have two hemi-nuclei, and then we stop, in Paul's words, and then chop. So engage a hemi-nucleus and pull it centrally so that it's just easier to get the chopper around it. Great idea. So let's apply phacodynamic principles. So we embed the phaco needle in the center, anterior, uh, posterior dimension of the nucleus. We embed it enough to where we get a good grip. Uh, we use only enough ultrasound and vacuum to get a tight vacuum seal. And then come off of ultrasound, make sure that you're not in position three, but in position two, tip's not vibrating. And now we use vacuum to centrally displace this hemi-nucleus so it's a lot easier to get the chopper around it. Now, there are a lot of other things going on in these slides I want to point out. Number one. If you look at the original FACO chopper, this sharp right angle, that's kind of hard to get in and out of a paracentesis. Uh, this is a, a, a instrument I designed, a, a chopper, and this curve, it just turns out it's easier to get in and out of a paracentesis. The reason I designed it this way it's designed to fit the, per the periphery of the, uh, the nucleus. So it's just reverse engineered to, to fit that. And the junction between the shaft and the ball tip creates a wedge that locks in. So if you simply drop it down, the dimensions were, were sized such that if this upper shaft is at the top of the nucleus, this ball will be at the right point where it creates a wedge. It basically, it forces the, the nucleus to fit in. Second thing, so I, I say this because you have to understand how your instruments are designed so that you can properly use them. Um, second thing is, note on this bottom diagram where the instruments are. If you draw a dashed line between the bottom of the chopper and the bottom of the phaco needle, they're both posteriorly enough place to where this dashed line encompasses a majority of the cross-sectional area of the nucleus. That's important because chopping, at least horizontal chopping, which is what we're talking about here, is a compressive maneuver. It depends on compression of the crystalline structure of the nucleus to propagate, to initiate and propagate a crack. So in order to get this compression and for it to work, let's go back, you have to have this majority of the, of the cross-sectional area encompassed. If you have either or both of the instruments too anterior, you won't have enough cross-sectional area engaged and compressed and you're going to get an incomplete chop. What if you have it just like this, you've done it perfectly, but instead of translating the chopper along this dash line so you continually have that cross-sectional area compressed, you translate anteriorly, which means you have an ever-decreasing cross-sectional area. As you, you propagate the chop, your chop becomes less and less efficient, and again, likelihood will be incomplete. And not understanding this, you would say, well, why wasn't it complete? And this is why it all comes back to the mechanics of how does the maneuver work, how are the instruments placed, how are the instruments translated. So again, at this point, we're done with phaco dynamics. Once we have this nucleus trapped between the chopper and the phaco needle that's embedded, you don't even need vacuum. You've trapped it. It's not going anywhere. Now it's all technique. It's all translation. It's all mechanical advantage. Looking at bird's eye view, surgeon's view, here we've uh, displaced the hemi-nucleus centrally, and this just underscores the fact that at this point, you no longer need the high vacuum that was required to centrally displace this hemi-nucleus. So ideally, here's a point where you would decrease vacuum. High vacuum to displace it, to grab it, displace it, chop it. As you're chopping, wouldn't it be nice if you could lower the vacuum to a more appropriate level for the next step, which is carouseling phaco aspiration that doesn't require that high vacuum level and indeed becomes a clinical liability for you. The higher vacuum level means it's more likely to get a post-occlusion surge chamber instability. Wouldn't it be nice if we could lower it? And we're going to find out how we do that. <laughs> Vertical chopping. So again, you have to understand this is a different technique. Even though it's called chopping, the mechanics are different. So this uh, was uh, simultaneously introduced by uh, Kunihiro, no, no, it was uh, Hidaharu Fukasaku of Japan, uh, Vladimir Pfeiffer in Slovenia, and Dave Dillman uh, here in the US. They simultaneously described vertical chopping. So 
And the advantage is everything happens in the center. You don't have to go out to the periphery. In vertical chopping, you place your chopper here in the center and you push straight down so it cleaves into the nucleus after first fixating the nucleus in a similar fashion that we did initially to horizontal chop. And as you continue to propagate the chopper downward, you pull up a little bit with vacuum and you create a shear force inside of the, uh, uh, the crystalline structure of the nucleus along with a slight horizontal separation and that creates this crack right in the center. Again, just brilliant technique that depends on the mechanics uh, uh, and uh, the structure of the nucleus. But there's some things to keep in mind. Where do you put the chopper? Well, here are two different positions for the chopper. I've, you know, I've embedded the phaco tip, and now I'm, I want to put the chopper in and cleave into the nucleus. The blue arrow you see here on the chopper is the vector force required to penetrate into this particular nuclear density. Now, I can apply that force here or here. If I apply it here, then I'm creating a certain torque. And the, the torque is simply the lever arm, the length of the, from the pivot axis to where I'm applying the force that creates a torque. If I apply that same force further away from the pivot axis with a longer lever arm, then I simply have a greater torque. A greater torque means that's going to be a bigger twist on this, which means it's more likely to break the vacuum seal. And again, you have to go back and ask yourself, was there any reason to do that? Is there any clinical advantage you're getting by introducing this clinical liability of the increased torque? And the answer is no. So recognize that. This is part of technique before technology, optimizing your technique to minimize the amount of vacuum and grip that you have to apply with a parameter. Uh, here, when it is placed a little bit further away, there's an option of vectoring it so that it ends up in the same area. And this is a variation of Steve Arshinoff's slice and separate technique. Understand your instrumentation. You have to understand how they're constructed and how it relates to the technique that you're trying to accomplish. So for example, uh, these are both ends of an instrument that I make. Uh, uh, now by, I, I'll have to update this line. Uh, Ryan was uh, purchased by uh, Corza. Corza is very kindly here providing instruments for you. Um, so on one end, I have my vertical chopper. On the other end, I have a horizontal. If you look at the side view, they look kind of similar. I mean, they're kind of rounded instruments. You'd think, yeah, you could use either end. But then you look a little more closely, and you realize on the vertical chopper, the beveled edge is at the bottom. Well, that makes sense, because it's a vertical chopper. You put it on top of the nucleus, and you want to cleave down into the nucleus. Of course, you want the beveled edge down here to reduce tissue resistance. Uh, the, the beveled edge on the horizontal chopper is here on the inner side of the curve because that's how the instrument's designed to be used. You, you know, if here's your nucleus out here, here's a cross section, and I put the, the chopper out here and I'm pulling centrally, that's where I want the cleaving edge on that end, not on the bottom. It's not doing any good in a horizontal chop. So you have to understand that distinction. But secondly, the bigger difference is look at the top view. If you look at the top of the vertical chopper, you see it has a very thin profile because we want to minimize tissue, you know, tissue resistance as we cleave straight down into the nucleus. If you look at the top view of the horizontal chopper, well, it's an olive tip. It's got a huge cross-sectional area. It makes a terrible vertical chopper because it has all this you know, cross-sectional area resistance. If you push down with that, you're, you're going to end up just breaking zonules. You're just going to push the nucleus. If it's a hard nucleus, just push it right away. It's not going to cleave in. So understand how the technique works that you're trying to, to accomplish and how the instrumentation dovetails with that so that you're using the instruments uh, most effectively. Uh, really short slide on, on laser. I was just talking about this with Nick. Uh, I, I had the privilege of working with Optometica, you know, in Silicon Valley, bringing it to market. Uh, my name's on 10 of the patents for it. And the uh, overwhelming world literature shows it makes absolutely no difference in the outcome. And I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. One paper came out recently, maybe, maybe, that shows for harder cataracts, maybe it makes some difference. But even there, they don't even look at the free radicals introduced into the AC by the Fento Energy itself. There are a couple of good papers that actually look at those uh, markers of inflammation. But yeah, bottom line, we thought this would take care of some chopping. <laughs> Makes no difference. I tell patients to save their money. I tell them it's fun to use, but I don't think they should pay for me to have fun. Um, Post-occlusion surges. We're using chopping and we're using higher vacuum. We're building up higher levels of vacuum inside of the machine. And here's where compliance comes in. Remember we talked about that? that compliance is a change in volume over a change in pressure. So as we're building up vacuum uh, between an occluded fragment and a pump, <clears throat> 
we pull compliance out of the system. So to, to whatever degree there's elasticity in the aspiration line, and by the way, there has to be some for ergonomics. If there's no compliance, you have a solid steel tube. There, there's no ergonomics in that. You're you know, moving the handpiece, you're moving the whole machine up and down. So there's some compliance, and so you pull that out of the system, the aspiration line c collapses, you start to pull air out of solution, and all of these things represent a potential force, a potential vacuum over and beyond the steady state that you said at the beginning of the, of the case that allowed for adequate chamber stability under a you know, steady state flow. Now all of a sudden we're going to add this on top of that steady state flow and it's going to be pulling out fluid more rapidly. And that's what can lead to an anterior chamber dimpling or even collapse as that uh, compliance re-equilibrates when the material is break, broken down under either an ultrasound or a vacuum load. <coughs> so here's what that looks like uh, on an on oscilloscope. And, you should be somewhat familiar with this because you'll see these occasionally in, uh, in advertisements and certainly in, in, in some papers. So here we have on, on the y-axis, we have intraocular pressure at you know, 30 inches of, of water. That'd be a, you know, close to a physiologic pressure. And uh, here we're in pedal position one. So basically, and this is time on the bottom on, on the, uh, the x-axis. So in pedal position one, we have, we're pressurizing the anterior chamber. As we step into pedal position two, if we go from here to here, we're lowering the intraocular pressure, and the reason for that is we have, again, this is assuming just an irrigating bottle up here. If we're now pulling fluid out of the anterior chamber, that's lowering the pressure because some of that pressure head is going into feeding that flow and maintaining the pressure, so the IOP drops. Um, the uh, uh, Centurion with Active Sentry, for example, uh, their, their, uh, their current machine with an upgrade will maintain, does that me to start talking faster? <laughs> uh, they're, they're, it'll maintain the IOP that you set, so you won't see this drop. But again, here, a, a traditional machine, you'll see this drop. And now, if you occlude right here, you go right up to the, the steady state, because now you're not pulling fluid out anymore. The aspiration port's occluded, and so you're at whatever steady state IOP or pressurization you set. Here, we break the occlusion. And here is where the compliance in the system will cause a pressure drop beyond the steady state. Notice this little spike here uh, that goes down to even lower pressure, and that's where the chamber may dimple a little bit before it comes back up to steady state until you release the pedal position one again. So it's this spike down here that's supposed to occlusion surge. Well, if you look at this lower diagram, here's a spike at different levels of vacuum. Post-occlusion surge is driven by vacuum. The higher the vacuum, the higher the compliance change in, in the system, the greater the post-occlusion surge. So here you can see at a pressure of 100, 160, 250, you can see the surges get greater, and here's zero, uh, you know, here's you know, zero pressure. This is ambient atmospheric pressure. If the pressure in the eye drops below this, that's where we get a collapse. And the extent to which this spike drops below that, and you basically just integrate the area of the curve uh, under there to see how much of a time and amplitude you have, the greater the, uh, and the potentially more damaging that spike. You need to be on the lookout long before you get to this. So let's look at some examples. And also, let's, how do you deal with it? Well, understand that post-occlusion surge is fundamentally driven by vacuum. So if you're getting a surge, the first thing you do is, well, that's too much applied vacuum. Back off on it. Um, increase your bottle height if you can. Increase the IOP. Uh, you would do that even before you, uh, you decrease the vacuum to see if you could mitigate. And there's some things you can do. We talked about using a more resistive needle if you're not already doing so. You're not going to change that in the middle of the case, but something to keep in mind going forward. Dual linear pedal control, I think, is a huge help for that, and, and I'll show you why. Uh, here's an example. <clears throat> this is the uh, Bauschenlohm Stellaris, and what it does is as you increase vacuum, it actually increases pressurization at the same time. So the Alcon system tries to read the pressure dropping and then mitigate it, and that, that's, that's a valid approach. The BNL takes a, more of a proactive approach and actually tries to increase the vacuum ahead of a break, or excuse me, increase pressurization ahead of a break based on the amount of vacuum. So let, let's see what that looks like. So if you watch, as vacuum increases, the infusion pressure is increasing at the exactly the same rate. And the idea is, if an occlusion breaks at any point, the infusion pressure is matching or mitigating that level of vacuum. So again, it's just another engineering approach, but you want to be aware of that, and you want to have your machine set accordingly so, so it enables that. So let's look at some clinical examples of surge. Here, here's a subtle example. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Maybe not so subtle. Mm -hmm. What surge? Too much fluid going out, not enough coming in. So remember, increase infusion pressure. If that's not enough, then decrease your, your vacuum load. Uh, if that's not enough, come out of the eye. Something's wrong. Uh, that uh, obviously, this was a machine malfunction. Uh, we had to change machines. There was a problem with the uh, pressure transducer. So there can be more subtle uh, examples. So here I'm using an old FACO needle with a huge aspiration port for getting that last little bit of epinucleus. Post occlusion surge. Yeah, I like that sound. That was the sound I made. I had the sound turned off. Look at my chopper. It's kind of watching here out from the side. Uh, it's not really being much help. What it, where it should be is right underneath the FACO needle. And it should be in that plane, notice, in a horizontal plane. So basically what we're doing is maximizing surface area. In case capsule does come up, we maximize surface area over which any force is applied, so we minimize pressure at any given point. Um, and so what could I have done? Well, yeah, I should have had the, the chopper underneath the, the FACO needle, and conceivably I could have used a little bit lower vacuum there. So, <clears throat> uh, the nice thing about silicone IA is that it's impossible to get a posterior capsule, oops, break. Yeah, so the, this is the posterior capsule rupture, and that was from post-occlusion surge, even with a silicone. You should absolutely use a silicone IA. I think Bobby Osher even came out and said it was malpractice not to, uh, you know, being soft-spoken as he is and not opinionated. But I agree with him. He did a great video on it. Uh, but yeah, this is just simple physics. That's just shear force that are under a really high post-occlusion surge. A capsule just slammed into it, and uh, you know, at a right angle, yeah, caused a rupture. I, sh you know, shouldn't have been using. That was just a little bit lazy, I think. Uh, ideally, would have just switched back to the FACO handpiece for that epinucleus because you can remove epinucleus with an IA, but you have to use a much higher vacuum than you would for cortex, and so that's going to create the uh, possibility for a greater post occlusion surge. <clears throat> So I want you to look at this video because I want you to think about applying what we've learned and, and what's wrong. Uh, so I will set it up <clears throat> saying this is a, uh, we're doing a stop and chop, we've done a, a central divide and conquer, and I want to engage this hemineucleus, and I want you to watch and tell me what you think and what we need to do. So I'm engaging, and it's pulling out. Engaging again, and it's pulling out. Mm -hmm. Engaging again, hoping magically it'll be different, and of course it's not, it's pulling out. So I don't have enough grip. So I am gonna change something. Now, look here, I'm going to a fresh area. I don't wanna go in the same area that's already eroded. I'm modulating a parameter, and I've got great grip now. I can get the chopper around there. So, what were you thinking on the first <clears throat> you know, three attempts, which were the same thing? Uh, what needed to change, what did we change, and why did it work? What, what, what's the parameter in play? You guys are on the line. I'm not going to go ahead until, uh, until I get an answer. You, yeah, you had a one in four chance. There are four parameters. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. It's vacuum. We didn't have enough grip. What do we want to check before we change the parameter? What do we want to make sure of? Technique before technology, what do we want to look for? I think I'm hearing it. So aspiration port occlusion. The status of the aspiration port drives everything that happens in, in FACO. You have to see what's going on right at the aspiration port. So I had to make sure, number one, it was occluded. Number two, it was well occluded. Was I in the you know, center, anterior, posterior dimension of the nucleus? Did I have a tight uh, vacuum seal with appropriate ultrasound, not excessive? Was the vacuum right for the, uh, that nucleus? Once having established all of that, yes, absolutely. I needed to increase vacuum so I'd have a stronger grip so I could pull that hemineucleus centrally. Um, and then, yeah, once uh, having optimized all of that, yes, we needed more vacuum, more grip. So here's another stop and chop. I want you to watch the tip. Watch the tip. What happens? Do you see how that hemineucleus lunged onto it and we almost went right through the periphery into a capsule? I'm changing a parameter here. I'm going right next to it. I probably should have gone a little bit further away. But now we have more appropriate control grip and I could move that fragment centrally for safer carouseling phaco aspiration. What was the parameter in play that caused that uh, very abrupt lunge onto the, uh, the tip? What's going on? It's not too high. It's not too high? 
vacuum is absolutely too high. Yeah, so the, the tip was occluded. I engage vacuum, it's just a pressure differential. So I'm, I'm pulling hard here. This material is going to crush in more rapidly. It was way too high a vacuum for that level of nuclear density. Should have engaged more gradually and looked more for a visual feedback. So another answer that, that I hear periodically is too much ultrasound. What do you think of that? And you're a little bit of a disadvantage because we did not go a lot into um, into basics of ultrasound. But I will tell you that basic ultrasound is the needle going back and forth. Variations of that are Osel, where it rotates, and White Star, where it kind of goes in an ellipse. But the tip's moving. And so either with Osel, it's going this way, and all the others, there's some kind of longitudinal motion to it. So what would higher ultrasound do relative to what we saw? It pushes. It pushes away. It doesn't, it doesn't drag toward. It doesn't pull in. If anything, it's neutral, like Osel, or if it's either of the others, it's pushing. Ultrasound won't cause a lunge like that. Now, ultrasound can facilitate vacuum working. So for example, if it was a really hard nucleus and uh, I applied a lot of vacuum, it's not going to move because it just it can't break down. Ultrasound facilitates vacuum moving. Ultrasound breaks down the material so that vacuum can then deform and pull it in. But ultimately, something that's pulling in is driven by pressure differentials, driven by the vacuum that you've set. Um, OK, so here's an example. Gosh, here are so many things that are going to be wrong with this video. I'll, uh, we'll just play through it. Uh, it's a shallow chamber, a small pupil, really leaky incision, which is why it's a shallow chamber. The phaco needle's not being, the chopper's being held vertically, not horizontally, which is where it should be. Uh, and so rather than take the time to fix all those things, we're just powering on ahead. And there's the first posterior capsule rupture, probably running right into the phaco chopper. There's the second one. And by pulling out the instruments rapidly here, we allow the vitreous to come forward, which widens the rent, which makes it's a lot easier to get your anterior vitrectomy instruments in. Yeah, I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> uh, this, this was an awful case. Uh, and again, everything was wrong. But it was post-occlusion surge. It was a um, it was an epinucleus done without any protection of chamber depth. Should have you know controlled the incision, deepened the chamber, uh, controlled infusion pressure. <clears throat> not have the phaco chopper pointing straight down, but have it horizontally. So we could have a separate half-hour discussion on all the things wrong. Bobby would go crazy with this video. Uh, Here is an example. So we're doing a stop, this is an old technique, my bridal suture, and I think it was getting ready to do a trap. I don't know why I was going so far back, but at any rate, we're doing a chop, and it's working relatively well. We're chopping, and things are aspirating, and things are going fine until they aren't. So here's a fragment. I want to get that into the aspiration port. I want to, I want to get to lunge. But that fragment's not coming to the tip. Where's it going? Everywhere else. Here it's coming to the uh, paracentesis incision, so I have to you know, push it away. That should have been my clue immediately that, hey, something's wrong here. But you know, so I push it back in and say, get back there. And I try to engage in, in position two. <clears throat> and it's just wobbling all around in there. Uh, and again, I have some incisional leakage here. Uh, and I'm actually in position three here. You can actually see some vibration, meaning that I'm in ultrasound, but something's missing. What's wrong here? It's going to the, the paracentesis incision where there's leakage. It's going to the main incision where there's leakage. It's not going to the aspiration port, which is where there should be what? I'm in position two, pump's working. What should be happening at the aspiration port? Remember the schematic, remember the, uh, the, the diagram where you've got a current going through the eye, right? Out through the irrigation ports and through the aspiration port. There should be a current being drawn into the aspiration port and out through the handpiece. That's not happening here. We've lost aspiration outflow. You have to recognize that. When you saw that vibration on the, the phaco needle, that meant I was in ultrasound without any aspiration outflow. I was a heartbeat away from another incision burn. Something's wrong. You have to be able to recognize that based on your understanding of how things are supposed to look and how the machine is supposed to function. So recognizing that, you stop. You get out of the eye. Something's wrong. And it turned out this is what was wrong. This was an early iteration of one of the early generation machines that experimented with a small diameter aspiration line tubing as an increased resistor uh, to mitigate post-occlusion surge. <clears throat> 
and they hadn't figured out uh, with that uh, small bore tubing how to fit it over the lure fitting so that you had this little pinch right here, if you look right in this area, where it decreased the uh, uh, internal diameter even more than the, the steady state out here, it simply caused a buildup of nuclear material. It was clogged. You just had to come out, clean that out, irrigate it, put it back, everything's fine. You have to recognize when the machine isn't operating properly and stop when that happens. Put a test chamber on, troubleshoot. Um, there can be problems with irrigation inflow. Uh, an overly zealous uh, uh, technician might have you know, clamped all the, the lines together so it will look really pretty, but they may have clamped the irrigation line a little bit too tightly. All of a sudden, you have compromised infusion inflow. If something's not operating properly, recognize it, stop, troubleshoot. You can ask your tech to do it, but ultimately, it's, you're obligated as a surgeon to know that machine better than anyone in the room. Captain of the ship. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? Ah, so this, <clears throat> what I want to point out on here, and I'll, I'll start the video in a moment, I want you to, to sense how enormously deep this chamber is. Look at the, the pupil, it's just dilated way out, and you can see that, you know, we've got a nice uh, Purkinje image here, but the posterior, uh, um, the PSC cataract is blurry because it's so far out. So we've got a profoundly deep anterior chamber. Here are our settings, by the way, uh, and this is the, the BNL machine. They use a combination of gravity and infusion. That's why we see two numbers here. I've been arguing with them to give just one number, but anyway, so 44 and 10. So we've got 54 millimeters of mercury. A little high, but that's not unusual for FACO. But Let's take a look. This is just way too deep. I mean, we're doing IA, we're doing okay, but man, is that deep. So I'm thinking, whoops, I did not want to do that. So I'm thinking, too much infusion pressure. What do you think? What should we adjust? By the way, I'm wrong. That, that, that's not the problem. And it's something described by, I think, one of your attendings here, uh, but in private practice. Bob, uh, Sioni. And any takers? What's that? Absolutely right. Reverse pupillary Bach, uh, uh, iris of retropulsion syndrome, uh, described by uh, Bob Sioni, 2005. <clears throat> and the problem here is not one of parameter. Technique before technology. This is a mechanical, whoops, and there I go again. This is a mechanical problem. <clears throat> and so you can see how deep this is and watch how we fix it. <clears throat> it's nice having a silicone tip IA because I can use that soft tip to go just under the pupil edge and just break the, the adhesion. As soon as I do that, <clears throat> Pupil comes down, notice that the PSC cataract's in focus now. The chamber is now physiologic and normal. We didn't change infusion pressure at all. Technique before technology. Yeah, infusion pressure controls anterior chamber pressurization and even depth, but look for problems <clears throat> and mitigate before going to the parameter. So here's a subtle problem. I want you to watch really closely to the tip. Um, let's see if I can get ready to pause here. So getting rid of the anterior epinucleus, I want to chop, so I'm going to embed the phaco tip with ultrasound, and then I'll, I'll engage vacuum right there. So I put that in pause. Do you see what just happened? Do you see that little waveform right here? That You see that dark line? That's a fracture. It's, it's a stress fracture in the material of the cataract. And I'm using really high vacuum here. I'm using almost 400, and I just didn't need it. But that's how I know. That's how you know as a surgeon, because you apply that high level of vacuum, and you see a stress fracture, and you go, wait, that, that, that's not good. I shouldn't use that much vacuum, because now that vacuum and grip can't be translated to the rest of the nucleus, because I've, I've broken a piece off. So, well, whoops, I'm doing a lot of that. So we'll go forward here. Let me actually see if I can scoot on forward. There we go. So I'm going to keep going here. And I'll show you that I don't learn very quickly from my mistakes. And I'll do that a few more times. So here I'm going to try to do the chop also. And again, watch right at the tip. And you're going to see the same thing happen. Right there. Do you see that little piece of just break right ahead of it? So just I'm not getting as good a grip as I would have otherwise. And I'm just not paying enough attention to that. Uh, and again, it's going to break just a little bit here. So just a little bit right there and, and forward. So as soon as you see that, that tells you that vacuum is too high for that nuclear density. That's why we have linear control. You want to be able to modulate 
with your pedal and use only enough that you need. Now, here, I'm, I switch over to my horizontal chopper, and this I can use just like a finger. And so you can actually go behind it. So I'm gonna try to use vacuum here, but look, I think we're gonna have the same problem. See, right there. See, I just broke that piece off. I lost my handle, I broke the handle off. So I can use the chopper to actually just reach behind there and mechanically pull the fragment out. I don't have to use vacuum to pull it out. I can, you know, use a mechanical uh, instrument. So, you know, be flexible, adapt accordingly, recognize when there are parameter or mechanical problems and you wanna mitigate accordingly. So coming back to the standard pedal and this idea that, gee, it'd be nice if we could change vacuum to, so that it's appropriate for each step. And remember, if I want a moderate level of vacuum in the middle of position two and a moderate level of ultrasound in three, you can't do that with a standard pedal, but you can with a dual linear. So dual linear takes, <clears throat> it combines positions two and three into a single larger range of vertical travel uh, on, on the pedal. Larger range of travel means you have greater control sensitivity. If it's you know zero to 400 and you have a little tiny range, boy, you're gonna go to 400 pretty quickly. If you have a larger range of travel, you have more control sensitivity. We move ultrasound into a whole other direction on the pedal, yaw, side to side. Now, if I want a medium range of fluidics or vacuum, I can just step halfway into this range of travel and, and range two, and I can yaw halfway into range three for ultrasound. Now, all of a sudden, I have independent Dependent linear control of these parameters, and I can have both. Um, so let's see why that's important. How often do you get chatter of an ultrasound fragment on the tip? Do you get uh, hard nuclei in, in Salt Lake? We do in Beverly Hills, believe it or not. I mean, where do you think I get these videos? Uh, watch the chatter here. Do you see that? That's not following very well. We, we, we use the term followability. We make up words in ophthalmology, followability. Where did that come from? But at any rate, it means it's chattering, it's not feeding into the tip. And uh, so look at what's happening here. This, this is actually a GUI that I designed. This is based on uh, uh, my t uh, page in the textbook. So what you see here in your peripheral vision, this green bar is ultrasound. It's the yaw position of the pedal. It actually tells you both the parameter and what the pedal's doing. It's moving over in that direction that far. The blue, is how far we're depressing the pedal, that's vacuum. Uh, this is a vacuum a priority pump or vacuum control, so the more I press, the greater the blue bar, the greater the commanded vacuum. Once you understand all that, you can now look right at the surgery in your peripheral vision, understand exactly what's going on with ultrasound, vacuum, and pedal movement. So basically the problem here is I'm pushing too much <clears throat> and I'm not pulling enough. I've got way too much ultrasound, green, pushing away, I don't have enough vacuum blue fluidically pulling it, uh, pulling it in. So understanding that, watch. Watch the chatter, but with your peripheral vision, I want you to look what's happening with the green and the blue. So here's the chatter, chatter, chatter. And now look what I did. Green went to almost nothing, blue went down, so I'm pulling harder. Less push, more pull. It's that simple. You see chatter, you dynamically change your parameters to overcome it. You were pushing too much, not pulling enough. You reverse that. It's cured. Uh, but, but again, you can do that with, with dual linear on the fly. Let's look at a schematic, and we're getting toward the end if, if, if you're getting hungry for lunch or, or break. So here's stop and chop. I'm going to the side, increasing ultrasound, the white bar here, coming back to the center, uh, no ultrasound, I've got just vacuum. And what I did is I buried the tip, bearing in mind that it's coplanar with the surface I want to occlude. Now by depressing the pedal, increasing vacuum to my full preset here, I've got a strong grip, which is when I want it to displace that hemineucleus centrally, get the chopper around it. I've got that really high vacuum that I needed, but now that I've mechanically trapped the fragment, I can raise my pedal, lowering the vacuum to a moderate level. So that with this more moderate level, I can now yaw to the side, engaging a moderate level of ultrasound to match, match a moderate level of vacuum. See, I'm yawing to the side. Now I've got moderate levels of both, so I can safely aspirate this fragment in a carouseling fashion with much greater chamber stability than had I arbitrarily maintained that high vacuum that I needed to displace it centrally in the sop and chop maneuver. I no longer needed that high vacuum clinically. Remember, you use each parameter for a clinical purpose, and that purpose is done with. Now I want to phaco aspirate, and I want a stable chamber. I want a lower vacuum. So with dual linear, you can change that on the fly. I find that to be a big advantage. So here's how it looks in, in real life. 
Now, notice I've got full vacuum, no ultrasound on the chop. So I bury in both. You'll see, and again, with your peripheral vision, green and blue, moderate levels to bury, and then no green, full blue to rigidly hold that so I can vertically chop. There's more of a need for vacuum and vertical chop because you're inducing a torque. With horizontal chop, there's less need for vacuum because you're mechanically entrapping the, uh, the fragment between the two instruments. So <clears throat> my own preference is you know, vertical chopping when I can. If there's insufficient nuclear density, I'll switch uh, to horizontal. And my own preference is, is dual linear. A little thaco dust there. It bothers me a little bit, but I'm monitoring to make sure that clears. Now, once I've vertically chopped everything and all the fragments are destabilized, I just switch ends of the instrument. I flip it around, so now I've got the horizontal chopper, which I don't need any more vertical chopping. I can reach around uh, the periphery and now chop these into even smaller fragments that are more readily phaco aspirated. Little tiny bit of post-occlusion surge. Notice that when I evacuate, a little bit of narrowing of the pupil. And that's one of the things you look for. Pupil getting a little smaller right at, at post-occlusion and uh, chamber dimpling. It's very mild. You can see a little bit uh, normally. And so this is okay. Uh, so we proceed. Notice that when I rotate the nucleus, we push the, uh, the chopper out pretty far from the pivot axis. That way we get the most torque. See, I'm all the way out there. You don't get very good rotational torque if you're close to the central axis of rotation. So keep that in mind. Also notice how as I'm pulling it centrally, I'm keeping my chopper in direct contact with the anterior surface the whole time to make sure I don't inadvertently see a little chatter. So I modulate, decrease ultrasound, want to increase vacuum. I'm not doing it fast enough here. So not looking good. There I go, finally. So increase vacuum a little bit. Uh, I could have done more. I could have increased vacuum more, dropped ultrasound to, to reduce that chatter. Uh, David Chang taught us that as far as uh, keeping your chopper in contact with the anterior surface of the cataract as you propagate to the periphery to avoid getting on top of the capsule uh, inadvertently. Uh, if you haven't taken his uh, FACO CHOP course at uh, Academy, I, I can't recommend it strongly enough or reading his book on the subject. <laughs> So again, just carouseling phaco aspiration with these smaller chopped fragments, the smaller the better. Uh, and it's, it's so easy to just you know, chop them into smaller fragments. I mean, you're pulling them out with vacuum anyway. Um, that is uh, dual linear chopping. So can you do chopping with a standard pedal? Of course. Uh, so this is a, a, an infinity. This is the precursor to the, uh, the centurion. And of course, we can do the same vertical chopping maneuver here. Now, vertical chopping, I need higher vacuum. Here, notice the vacuum is going up to about 475 here. You're going to see a problem. Once I start to, uh, to vertically chop, what I didn't do is what, if you're using a standard pedal, I strongly recommend that you do. And that is to have a separate uh, setting, uh, a range setting for, uh, for fragment removal with a lower vacuum setting because you just don't need as high a vacuum for carouseling phaco aspiration as you do for vertical chop. Um, and you'll see here, as I now switch around to, uh, to the horizontal chopper and I start to evacuate these fragments and I keep that high vacuum level, and remember, I'm going to hit that high vacuum level each time because it's a standard pedal. Watch what happens. The chamber's shallowing. You can tell. Look at these folds between the, uh, the main incision and the paracentesis. And that's just a chamber shallowing. The pupil's getting smaller. And that, that's really, I think, a little excessive. Uh, I, at that point, I just should have recognized that and... Uh, you know, it, it decreased my vacuum for a more appropriate setting, a more appropriate range for that standard pedal. <laughs> so, believe it or not, we're actually to a summary. Uh, vacuum is for grip. You titrate it to the nuclear density based on what you see through the microscope. Um, Optimize vacuum seal, uh, technique before technology. Always look at that aspiration port. That's what's going to drive your clinical output based on whatever kind of control input you give. Remember mechanical advantage. Understand how the technique is designed to work. Understand how your particular instruments are designed so that it optimizes for that technique, both through their initial placement as well as follow through and translation. Technique before technology. Don't use parameters as a crutch for suboptimal technique. And when you're using higher vacuum, you want to control surge, uh, mitigate first through increased infusion pressure, whether setting IOP directly, bottle height. Uh, you may have to go to lowering vacuum level. And, and my own favorite is uh, dual linear pedal control. It's a lot of material. Uh, I think it's reflected in this. Uh, if you can hear, this is a video done by uh, Honda. Uh, it took 250 takes to get this. Remember mousetrap? Yeah. 
<laughs> so I think the way we learned FACO, Nick and I and Randy, uh, I think we needed a lot of takes. Uh, it was trial and error. What I'm hoping through FACO Dynamics is to give you a context of reasoning whereby you approach each case with understanding, uh, with logic, and you adapt accordingly to each step of the procedure and intelligently change. So you won't need 200 takes for each case. Isn't it nice when things just work? Mm -hmm. Best of luck. I appreciate you listening and uh, open to any questions. Thank you. First of all, uh, put us on your calendar because you're coming back every day to give this talk. And so this is critical because uh, we don't have the understanding of, of the equipment that you have. And there's been so many pearls here, I, I can't even begin, begin to talk about it. But Thank you. I, I used to work with the second year residents. And, and fortunately, I've got Grant up here. I don't have to do that anymore. But um, we didn't trust horizontal chop initially because we don't know where that's going. So we're yeah. vertical chop. And those pearls that you gave about the occlusion and you don't know how many times as we're working with second years they either use too much FACO or they come off, off the back and then they lose it and then the piece gets thinner and then it's harder to do that vertical chop and so all those pearls you gave are just invaluable so every June you are coming back. <laughs> you have to keep feeding me bagels but okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you Nick. I kind of heard two different camps on um, mitigating surge or just trying to prepare for it for the last piece as you're taking it out. And one you show where you're putting your second instrument underneath the fake up tip, or you could be. And then the other camp seems to be take the second instrument out of the eye because you're reducing leak through the para and thereby stabilizing the chamber a little bit more. On one of those sides? Definitely the former. I always want a second instrument in the eye. I, I don't want one instrument because you, if you have two instruments in the eye, here, here's the limbus, and you have an instrument here and here, you've locked the eye into XYZ. Uh, as soon as you take this instrument out, I mean, your Z is probably okay, but they can easily move their eye back and forth here. You've lost control. I never want just one instrument in the eye. I mean, you do it on I and A, uh, relatively safe silicon IA tip, but ideally I want the second instrument for control. With regard to a para leakage, there may be some. If it's excessive, I think you need to revisit the size of incision you're making for it and maybe consider a smaller, tighter one. Um, but I think you just need to set your steady state to account for that. So at the beginning, remember, you're going to set a steady state infusion pressure that you think is adequate for your setup, your incisions, your instrument, everything, and you're going to allow a little bit of extra headroom to mitigate post-occlusion surge. But I would simply include the uh, the side port instrument in that equation and keep it in and keep it under the uh, needle and definitely keep it horizontally, uh, not not down, just to maximize surface area in case the capsule does come up. But yeah, definitely in the former camp. Yeah. Yeah. Attendings and just see how they answer this. Ask them why they use the second instrument that they do and see if they have a thoughtful answer or if the answer is uh, because this is the second instrument I was trained on. And at Moran, we're pretty lucky. I think most attendings will have at least a somewhat thoughtful answer about you know, why they use the second instrument they do, but the vast majority, I think, of cataract surgeons who are operating right now. They are operating with the second instrument and they're using the te techniques they use because that's what their mentor did. And there was no actual thought or understanding to what the instrument does and what it's designed to do. So asking those questions as a part of your education, I think is a really important thing. Like, oh, why, do you, why did you choose this chopper? Um, why not this one? I noticed this tip and this tip are similar, but like, what do you think the advantages are? And honestly, if they don't know, then maybe that's a discovery you guys can go on together. But I think asking questions to help help you understand the actual decision making of the instruments that you're using and why you are choosing. Oh, why are you going to vertical chop this one instead of horizontal chop? What are the things that you're thinking? Ask your attendees those questions as you're operating so that you can apply all of this stuff as you're learning surgery. Couldn't agree more. I, I asked lots of questions. I, I became a very annoying resident, but uh, it, it, it led to go. Okay, thanks. <laughs>
there was another question hiding back there. Yeah. So yes, if I understand you correctly, so you were uh, not bearing the phaco needle initially, you weren't doing a divide and conquer, not bearing it in the tip, but just you had on the surface, phaco needle on the surface in the center. So the problem I have with that is, again, the, the mechanical nature by which chops propagate, and they propagate ideally under compression of the crystalline structure of the nucleus. If you have the, uh, if you don't have counter traction or a backstop, to the force that you're inducing with the chopper. So again, here's a cross-sectional area of the nucleus. You have a chopper out here pulling, and there's no counter force or backstop against which it's pulling. Then you're just stressing the zonules out here. By having the phaco needle here in the center and pulling this way into, you know, again, this, this half of the nucleus, not only do you have a backstop, you're preventing stress from the zonules, but you're allowing compression of the nuclear material between the two, which allows for a far more efficient, effective, and complete chop. So, so I would recommend against doing that. I understand the idea. And at some points, once you actually have the needle down there, and it's in that position in this you know, center anterior posterior position, you actually don't need vacuum at that point. But you need a vacuum and ultrasound to get to that point uh, before you, you know, put your chopper out here and start compressing. At that point, they are mechanically trapped. You don't need the, the vacuum, but I think you need the chopper at that, or you need the, the, the needle at that kind of posterior position so you've encompassed the largest, uh, the majority of the cross-sectional area of the nucleus to get compression. Yeah. Um, I know that some people have been talking about like the intelligent phaco cutting on the ground, especially if you put your and all that. I know at least one of our attendings like intentionally turns it off because the build-in of the raw material induces more chatter, and we feel like fallibility kind of goes down. So on certain stages, we leave it in like our main quad setting. Which yeah, uh, so so intelligent FACO will eventually refer to all of you doing surgery based on these principles. Uh, that being said, it's a clever marketing term that uh, that Alcon came up with. And my understanding, and then if we have an Alcon rep here, they can corroborate. My understanding is that it came about as a result of OSL, where you know rather than this back and forth of the longitudinal FACO, it was a rotation, and therefore there may have been an increased likelihood to get a clog within the handpiece. And if you have a clog, you interrupt flow. If you have ultrasound, you have potential for wound burn. So intelligent FACO, my understanding is that it senses that you know, pressure differential and, yes, applies some longitudinal FACO to clear a clog at that point to reintroduce flow. And as such, I would not want to turn it off. I, I would want to have that, that safety feature engaged. Uh, I understand the logic behind it, but I don't think the potential risk is worth it. Uh, we have a I'd like you to just touch on it. Real Please. Um, yeah. Just like much like you said, not necessarily to prevent a clog, but to pre prevent like over purchase or over occlusion if you're using torsional energy. So it's designed to kick in a longitudinal pulse, like you mentioned, but only when you need it. So you set the parameter at which vacuum threshold do you want that longitudinal pulse to hit. So a lot of times you'll set it at 95 percent of your vacuum threshold. If your vacuum threshold is 500, and once you get to 95 percent of that. You're really occluded at that point if the vacuum, based on the aspiration port being occluded, yeah. builds to that point. It's building pretty high, and that piece might kind of just be caught there. That kicks in just short enough to reposition the piece, and then back to, to torsional eating, you can just keep the piece up. So you yeah. can set the parameters. I would definitely have it on during quad. I would not use it during any other setting. I would not use it during sculpt. If you're sculpting deep, and all of a sudden you're used to like a torsional side to side motion, all of a sudden you get a longitudinal jump, I just use it during quad. Yeah. At some point, I'll, I'll do a very brief, like, you know, three or four minute lecture on capsule rexus, and I'll, I'll use the easel over there. I could either do it now or I could do it after a break uh, before we do wet lap. But you, your call. Yeah. Or Rachel. Your call. You're the master. You want to do it now? Yeah, we just do it now. Yeah. yeah.
So th this is really short, and just see the idea is again, you know, looking at mechanical properties of surgery and, and, and trying to make make sense of them. So when um, so any kind of surgery is is you're separating material. So. Their mechanical properties of material, and how do we separate? So there, there's a branch of mechanical engineering called fracture mechanics, and it basically has to do with well, how do we separate material? How do we fracture it? And there are really two fundamental ways. So, if you see here, we have this material, and we want to separate it here in the center. Well, if we pull on material, uh, we create a, a stress on the material. If there's a a, um, a force without any deformation, we call that stress. If we start to deform material, then we call that strain. And strain is simply the, you know, the amount of, of separation or deformation over the, uh, proportional to the amount of force applied. And there are different curves for material as far as, you know, you, there's a certain elastic amount of stress, and then you get to an elastic limit, and then it you know, starts separating and breaking apart. So there are two ways to, to separate material, and as we apply this to capsular rexus. So if we look here, <clears throat> This is called an out-of-plane fracture. So, you know, if we have a flat material and I want to separate it, I want to pull it or shear it out of plane. And so that's what we do. We take a strip of material and we pull from A to B. All of the force is right at A, and it goes right to B. There's no extraneous force applied. All the force goes into the shear of the out-of-plane fracture. Uh, and so it's, it's very controlled, very focused. For an in-plane, and by the way, this is how scissors work. You know, if you cut something with scissors, you're inducing an out-of-plane fracture. You're inducing a shear force. <clears throat> with an in-plane fracture, you're pulling material within the plane of it, trying to separate it. And the problem with that is you induce all of this force over the entire plane. Uh, right at, at this point here, at, uh, at C, you have a stress induced. Uh, at B, you have a strain induced because the force is already starting to separate material. And finally, at A, you actually have a separation of material. The problem is, by spreading the material over this large area, you have to have a much greater force to initiate a tear than you do to propagate the tear. And because it's uh, spread over such a large surface area, there's a lot of extraneous force. So why go into all of this trouble? When, when you're tearing a capsular rexus, which I'm hoping you're doing more and more with, without Fento. Uh, so the two ways to, to separate material, so again, I can try a uh, in-plane fracture in which I want to separate here, well, let's say here, and I just have to pull. And have to pull, and notice I'm putting stress all over the plane of the material until it finally separates. I'm not strong as it be. <laughs> and that's what happens. And it propagated all the way out to here because I've been building up that stress all into the plane of the material. Uh, that's why you don't have control when you're doing, doing an in-plane fracture. You want to do out-of-plane fractures because you can control how much force you're doing. If I pull this way and that way so I can do secure it out of plane, it requires very little force. And whenever I pull, that's how much it tears. So I know it's a, it's a simple concept, but you have to think every time you're doing a capsular rexus, how are you pulling the material? Are you pulling in plane or out of plane? I just want you to remember the large tear versus this. Now, by folding it over, you can create a curve. And in fact, the tear will usually mirror the template that you've set up with the folded over material. You, you can't change very rapidly. So uh, let's see, who came up with the uh, capsule rescue? British. Little. Brian Little. Brian Little. Brian Little. Uh, so what he points out, if you have to change direction rapidly, you need to switch to a, uh, a, an in-plane fracture. You have to unfold this, grab in-plane, but here's the key. And when you're doing anything in-plane, that's when you want to grab very close. When you're doing out-of-plane, I can be this far away, and it doesn't matter, because the force is propagated along the perimeter of the template to that point of, of out-of-plane fracture. If you want to be in plane, you don't want to spread force over that large area to get that extraneous tear. So if you grab really, let's see how I'm not blocking this. If you grab really close to here, then you can actually do a very sharp turn, like you see here. 
but you want to be really close to it. So if you are going out to the periphery, ideally if you're doing the outer plane fracture, you won't be there on the first one. So if you get there, you can do in plane, you want to be very close to the center part of the tear. And I show that here and just, you know, a video of uh, you know, Rexus that you've probably seen a zillion times. Uh, this is a Rexus forcep I designed that it's kind of interesting. You can actually see what you're grabbing. It was hard to do that, to actually mill a port in it. Uh, but this, this shows a, um, an out-of-plane fracture. Oh, I'm sorry, let me make that larger. So this actually measures also with the tip closed. You can actually measure and uh, you know mitigate corneal magnification to see how what pupil gap you want here for a given size rexus. But you can see how controlled that is just by rolling over the template and doing an out of plane fracture. You're going to get a smooth, round, controlled uh, rexus almost every time. I don't show a rescue here. This is just just the basic technique. So, little mechanical engineering for your morning. <laughs> You emailed us, I think, maybe it was like a month into my very first year as program director, and asked Randy about the possibility of becoming adjunct faculty. And uh, Randy forwarded it to me and says, you're the vice chair of education. This is your decision. And I was like, easiest decision <laughs> I will ever make in my entire life. Of course, the answer is yes. And um, so we were really lucky to uh, be able to have you as adjunct. And obviously, today is what we hope is the start of a very long uh, academic relationship. One of the things that I know you have talked about, and I think we would love as we continue to move forward with our surgical curriculum, is to have have these virtual video nights yeah. with a specific focus on phago dynamics. So residents, as you guys are operating, make sure that when you're recording your cases, you get the overlay. And this is something that Alan would be yell at me about on a daily basis. Are you recording the overlay? And um, and this is why, because you really cannot understand the mistakes that you're making or why isn't this piece coming or why do I keep doing this and the piece isn't coming out unless you understand the phaco dynamics of what you're telling the machine to do. Yeah. And we can't troubleshoot that unless we know what you're telling the machine to do. So make sure when you're recording your cases, you're getting the overlay. And to do that, you actually have to plug in. You can't just get the ones that Ethan records for us. Um, and of course, the whole time that you were speaking, I just had Alan's voice in my head yelling at me about physics. And you have to understand the physics of how the machine works. Like you can't, you're, you're asking the machine to do something you can't do. So who's the idiot here? You are the machine. And obviously the answer was always I was the idiot. Um, so uh, because so many things you say make us think of Alan, who of course is, you know, such an important, uh, uh, person and, and who Moran has become as a hopeful leader in, in cataract surgery and cataract surgery education. We have a couple little tokens of appreciation oh. for you. Um, one of them is a bolo tie, which of course is <laughs> Alan's signature tie. And um, wearing a tie, wearing a bolo tie, is a, a kind of an insider sign that you're part of the Moran family. So welcome and thank, thank you. you. Residents, you guys will have a very short lecture just on how to take care of the cords and instruments that um, we've been lucky enough to get for you. Just 10, 15 minutes after that, uh, a longer break so you guys stretch your legs and we'll get started with you. All right. Residents, if you guys want to come more forward to these few residents, residents. If you guys want to come more forward to these forward tables, um, Corza has been really great. And again, this is a, a partnership that uh, Tony Mai has started. Um, they have been amazing in uh, 
basically providing these instrument kits. And um, as I've mentioned before, we wanted to, <laughs> as I mentioned before, we wanted to make you guys um, aware of how to better care for them and also longitudinally hand these instruments down to the next class or um, you know have more information from Corza on instrument care and management and things like that. So thanks so much and help me welcome Corza. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica, and I'm from Corza, and I am here to talk to you about instrument care and handling. Now, this is a unique situation because in many cases, I will travel, or one of my colleagues will travel, and they'll work with the sterile processing departments on the nuts and bolts of taking care of instruments. This is not that. I mean, let's all be real. The, the odds of you ever going into the sterile processing department and cleaning and, and like sterilizing your own instruments is very, very low. But at the same time, I do think that there's a, uh, a slight disconnect in your, in your education because this is not something that is taught to you as part of your curriculum. Um, and I, I do think it's, it has importance. So obviously we know what the positive outcomes are of preventative maintenance and care and handling, right? Number one is patient safety. It's making sure that your surgical procedure goes as smoothly as possible and that the patient doesn't have any complications. Uh, but number two, it's also expenses. Now, you have not yet had to purchase your own instruments. Um, and maybe you won't ever have to purchase your own instruments. Maybe you will be going to a facility when you graduate and you go out into the world where you are um, you're going to a hospital and they have beautiful sets and you're never going to do that. But, but what if you do? What if you do, what, say you go to an ASC and you decide that you want to purchase your own specific set of instruments. You have been mindful of what actually Dr. Simpson said where she said, you know, ask why a certain item is used so that you have a better understanding of it because she's absolutely right. There are many doctors who just perform surgery with what they were trained on. Um, but then there are other people who have learned that there have been enormous developments since then. And those developments, you will be shocked to find out how much they cost to buy for yourself. So having an understanding of how to maintain your instruments in a way that allows you to save the most money as well as care for your patients in the best way is super duper important. So obviously, Again, you're not going to be actually cleaning or sterilizing the instruments, but it is important that you are able to recognize what is the difference between surface staining and rust. And what I am going to charge you with is to change your mindset. I mean, clearly we're changing our mindset from phacodynamics. <laughs> Already we've, we've made this change. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to recognize as the surgeon in the room how you set the temperature of that procedure. You can be the surgeon who supports their staff, who develops their staff, and who helps them get the education that they need in order to give you the best surgical outcomes. Or you can be that surgeon in the room who throws an instrument because something's wrong. I would like you to not be that person, if possible, or at least to think about it. So understanding surface stain and rust, what you, what you really need to understand is that there is probably nothing wrong with the instrument. It, it all has to do with the process. And it's your responsibility because you're looking through the surgical microscope to identify areas that need to be uh, dealt with. And you need to make careful notes. Even if it's only telling your nurse or your tech, this instrument is starting to, to we're starting to get a crack at one of the hinges. We're starting like very, very basic. You guys, can you guys hold up your hands? I, I can almost see, I think I see everybody who has the kits. Okay, hi. I'm mostly talking to you, but I'm not only talking to you. I'm also talking to the, the actual attendings and the surgeons that are in the room as well, because every day you have an opportunity to make the case go as well or as poorly, and you do play a part in it. So what causes rust? Rust does not happen just spur of the moment. It takes water, it takes air, it takes time specifically, and it takes steel. If you are lucky enough to work at a facility that decided to throw all their money at uh, titanium instruments, you will never see rust. You will see surface stain, but you need to have carbon in the metal in order to get rust, and titanium does not have that carbon. 
So that's a really good solution for that. It's also a great solution if you have difficulties with releasing a suture needle. Uh, say a needle driver or a tying forceps is magnetized. Titanium will never magnetize for the same reason. There's no carbon. So those are really good solutions. But what you need to recognize is that there are absolutely perfectly good stainless steel instruments, and you guys have them in your kits, that are functional, usable, and can last you, in theory, your entire career if you care for them properly, and that they are made to be cost-effective and really, really functional. For example, a scissors, if anybody ever gives you a titanium scissors, run away screaming, because a titanium, titanium doesn't have carbon, which means it can't be hardened or sharpened. So every time a titanium scissors is used, it will need to be resharpened. So avoid, avoid at all costs. 100% do not recommend. But rust doesn't happen in a vacuum. It literally doesn't. For example, if you were cleaning instruments on the moon, you would not get rust because there has to be air, there has to be time, there has to be moisture, there has to be steel. For your instruments, your kits that you have, I'm going to ask that you not use anything overly aggressive. So um, alcohol is fine for a, a first wipe, but really just use distilled or demineralized water, a soft, liquid soap, something that rinses clean, something that's low foaming, that's really all you need to take care of your instruments. But the, probably the number one thing is to try to get them as dry as possible. I've been all around the world, and some people have these fancy compressed air solutions. Some people use blow dryers, like for your hair. Anything that you can do to prevent moisture from collecting on the surface is going to help extend the life of those instruments. Now, when you receive them, they have tip guards on them. Those tip guards are really for packaging. They're not necessarily designed for sterilization, um, but it's not a bad idea that you pay attention to how you take them off, how you put them back on. Um, there are tricks to that. Um, I am a big proponent of the thumb on slide, like thumb off, bend and slide on, especially for like an angled chopper. Those are things you have to be careful of because placing and removing a tip guard can actually cause more damage than, than if you were just to leave it off. But all of these things are things that you're going to learn. Instruments, say you are king of all you survey. You have your own ambulatory surgery center and you are that man or that woman who makes all the decisions. What I'm going to ask you to do is to number one, understand that there is a process for cleaning and sterilization. There is. I know that when you're in the hospital or when you're at the VA, wherever you are, you're doing surgery, the case is done, you rip off your gown, you walk out of the room, you start charting, all that. You have no idea where those instruments go. For all you know, fairies could take them away and tap them with a magic wand and they come back. But that's not the case. Sterile processing can take up to an hour in, in many, many cases because there is a manual cleaning aspect, an ultrasonic cleaning aspect. A, some facilities use washer disinfectors. Um, there's always an assembly and should be an inspection aspect. And then sterilization. And that can literally take one hour to two hours to do properly. If each step is not followed, and if there are shortcuts taken in that process, you, because you're the man or the woman that owns this facility, are going to be cited by CMA. CMS, sorry, not CMA, CMS. Because you are not following manufacturer's uh, instructions for use. And that is a number one requirement. You have to follow the process. And that means that just because you need a tray or you have a quick turnaround, you can't say to your team, I need this back in 10 minutes. It's not going to happen. And you're going, if, if that happens, you are going to be cited. So this is, we're not talking about just instrumentation anymore. We're talking business. As a business, you need to have highly trained staff. You need to understand that there is a process. You probably need to have enough uh, instrument trays so that you can follow this process reliably all throughout the day. And remember, it ha you have to have enough instrument trays to do this properly on your busiest surgical day. Keep that in mind. And if you can't do that, you have to prove why, what you're doing to mitigate that factor. These are super important things. Inspection is very important. 
so is cleaning and sterilization and packaging. When new instruments are purchased, we have a very, very clean facility. All of our instruments, and if I'm going to be honest, a lot of other companies' instruments, everything I'm saying has to do with every company that's making microsurgical instruments. But all of, all of the, the Corsa ones that I can speak to are actually handmade or hand finished by master craftsmen. So when you're looking at these instruments, you're not looking at something that was punched out in a factory. You're looking at something that has hours and hours of expertise and work into them. But that still means, it doesn't mean that they're sterile. We have a clean facility, but we do not have a sterile facility. So any instrument that is received into a surgical facility should be cleaned, first inspected to make sure that it's in perfect condition because sometimes during shipping you can have real issues with how the the boxes are cared for. Um, and then obviously it needs to be cleaned and sterilized. This is one of those interesting slides because I, I present this when I speak to sterile processing departments and nurses, uh, like peri-op nurses. The first step of cleaning happens in the OR. Your tech, when you hand them an instrument, should be wiping or flushing or rinsing the instrumentation because any amount of time that, say, viscoelastic or blood or BSS is allowed to sit on or inside of the lumen of an instrument is going to make it that much harder for the sterile processing team to clean. And maybe you don't care. But I'm telling you, it, it doesn't take very long for a 27-gauge hydrodissection cannula to go the way of the dodo. All you need is a little bit of visco in there, and it's super glue. And now you, and now you have a single use. <laughs> at, at that point, you started with a reusable. Now you have a single use. Um, but it's very, very important. And you need to support your team. You need to support them, and you need to explain to them, you know what? I understand that, that our job here is to help the patient. But I also understand that you have other responsibilities that go beyond that so that we can stay fiscally responsible as far as an organization. Please, 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 when you are either being passed instruments or when you're passing them back to your techs, please be careful. Don't catch them on drapes. Absolutely. And I've seen this. I've seen this so many times, and it just hurts my heart. Please don't toss or drop instruments onto the Mayo stand when you're done using them. They, technicians are taught how to pass. And, and like, they're good at it. Let them do their job. If, if, you're, if you take the time to just drop something on the Mayo stand and you have a 0 0.12 forceps or a Seibel horizontal chopper, the, the odds of that, that tooth bending or that tip breaking off or even just getting micro cracks in the steel is really, really raised. And, and that's a concern. So passing instruments is very, very important. Um, and obviously not throwing them across the room is super important as well. As I mentioned, in the sterile processing department, there will be a manual cleaning aspect. There will be an inspection aspect. Inspection is crazy important because what you don't want, and actually what they don't want either, is for an instrument tray to get to you with an instrument that's unusable. Now, I know why you I mean, you can tell me why you don't want to have an instrument that's unusable, especially a critical instrument. Say a capsular excess forceps, and, and we're talking about cataract here. If you have a capsular excess forceps where the tips don't touch, where they don't ex perfectly align, you're going to have a really, really difficult time grasping that tag and tearing a CCC. What the sterile processing team doesn't want you to get that instrument for is because if that critical instrument is unusable, you're going to have to open a second tray. And now they have to clean two sets of instruments, which is an enormous waste of their time and energy because they're probably supporting other specialties as well. Um, placing instruments in the tray, I am hoping when you receive the, the instruments, they were all placed sort of with their butt end like the non-functional end close to the edge of the tray and plenty of space for the, the functional ends, whether it's a tissue forceps, a scissors, a chopper, whatever, the re a manipulator, those should be a little bit removed because in the, the chance that you bang into something and you knock them, you don't want those delicate tips to get too close to the edge and bend. It happens all the time. And I mean, you can see, here's, it actually looks a lot like a chain but you can see that it's starting to come through the mesh. 
you want to make sure that all of those functional ends are as far away from the edge of the tray. And sometimes that means, honestly, having fewer instruments in your tray. Or maybe it means having a more appropriately sized tray. That's a big thing. And you wouldn't think that an instrument company, I would go out and say, you have too many instruments. Usually you would think that I would say, oh, you need to buy more instruments, right? No. The fact is that most facilities add instruments when new surgeons come in. Very rarely do they remove instruments. So you might have a sterile processing team cleaning 30, 40 instruments in a, in a surgical tray and only 10 are being used in each case. That's huge inefficiencies. So right sizing a tray is very important as well. Cost. These are old costs, like scary old costs. That micro incision, that $895 forceps is probably over a thousand now. I don't know, I don't, do, I don't do commercial anymore. All I do is education, so that's nice. But you can see that center spatula, that $140, that's just, that's like a basic spatula, a lens spatula. It was placed too close to the edge, so it didn't just hit the edge, it also turned a corner. And many of these can be repaired, but the question is, do you want this to be given to you in the OR when you know that every minute of OR time is costing money? Do you want to have to, to be given one of these instruments when you have a patient that has an, an open wound and you have to worry about complications? <laughs> Do you want, as Dr. Seibel said, to have an instrument that was designed to do a, a certain purpose, but because the, the staff or the team or the process is flawed and they're not perfectly aligned, do you want to need to take the time to sort of adjust how you do your surgery, right? Like, ideally, you're gonna go from OR to OR to OR if you're doing cataracts, and you wanna have exactly the same surgical technique. That's the most efficient, that's the safest, that's how you, quite honestly, make money, is by being efficient and safe. If the instrumentation is not reliably in the same condition, you're going to have to adjust. And now, not only do you have to worry about all the, the different intricacies of each patient that presents, but now you have to worry about your trays. That's a little bit too much. Let's, let's control what we can control, and let's adjust to the patients as needed. Um, when transporting or storing instruments, that's, please don't do any of that. Um, all of this is just terrible. Um, if, if you can make sure that there's no BSS, that there's no viscoelastic, that there's no blood or, or cortical debris, um, super cool, love that. Uh, stacking instruments and trays on top of each other, probably not cool. And this applies not just to your own kits, but to the, the, what you are using in the OR, what you're using in the, the training lab. Because we were there for a cornea, I think it was a cornea, yeah, yeah, it was very, very cool. But you know, you go in there and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God. Okay, we can do better. So like just organizing. Um, and then when you're carrying your trays, I'm going to ask, please don't carry them under your arm like a book. Uh, because anything like uh, Sinsky, anything round handle, the, the, sometimes they're called stick instruments, they'll slide. Even with the silicone finger mats, they can slide. So try to keep them as flat as possible. And then I have to say this, regardless of what company's instrumentation you're using, there is almost always going to be a local sales rep. And you should be leaning on them 100% of the time. Number one, they can provide you with support for your staff. They can do in-services. They can do tray assessments. They can give you literature and documentation. They can provide videos. Um, enormously helpful but not only that um, they can tell you how to con how to connect with other reps most of the reps that are out there and and this is something that I'm, I'm excited about for our resident training program is the opportunity to connect you wherever you go with somebody that you can say hey I'm new here do you know where I can get a Malugan ring do you know where I can get you know I who's the Alcon rep it has nothing to do with what we sell, but you're creating a network of people, and that's what sales representatives, good sales representatives, are meant to do. They're meant to be consultative, and they're meant to make connections. So please use them as much as possible. That's why they're there. Um, make them work for their money, right? Make them work. Because 
all in all, really, it's very, very important that you recognize that everybody is working together. Everybody's working together to provide the best patient experience, the best surgical outcome. Um, but maintaining your instruments, nothing that Dr. Seibel talked about would have been as effective if his tools weren't in good condition. All of his technique, all of his training, everything, you have to have tools that work. And there are a lot of people that make do with really crappy tools. But just imagine a world where you didn't have to. Just imagine how much easier your lives would be, how, how much fewer complications you would have. So that's what I charge you with. I charge you to go out and to, to be the captain of your ship and to, to set the temperature in the room and say, we're gonna take care of our instruments, maybe not first, First is the patient. Second is making sure that we're fiscally responsible and taking care of, of the tools that we need in order to take care of our patients. So if anybody has any, I'm not gonna take any more time because I'm trying to be mindful of time, but if anybody has any questions, I am here. Um, I'm the director of medical education, uh, but in addition, we have Jeremy. Jeremy Kelly is the local rep in this area. Um, if you have any questions, if you have difficulty sleeping and you would like a sleep aid, this is great, honestly. Um, we, can, we have a couple samples here, but we can certainly send them out. Um, I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of working with Moran. Um, and if we can help in any way, whether it's with your kits or it's with additional education, please let us, okay? So thank you.